my uh, sincere apologies for being a little late this afternoon because of other meetings, but I do want to personally welcome our distinguished uh, uh, guests and experts on this issue that we're going to be discussing this afternoon. The subcommittee hearing will come to order. This is the subcommittee on Asia Pacific and the global environment on the Committee of Foreign Affairs. The topic of discussion this afternoon is climate change finance providing assistance for vulnerable countries. As is the procedure for most hearings, I'm going to give my opening statement. And then thereafter, my good friend, the ranking member of our subcommittee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Manzula, will give his opening statement. And then also my good friend from California, Congressman Robacher, for his opening statement. And then afterwards, we will then proceed and invite our guests for their testimony. Today's hearing on climate change finance is the third in a serious focus on the impact of global warming on the most vulnerable nations. Last December in Copenhagen, is it Copenhagen or Copenhagen? How do you pronounce this? Does it matter? I always say Hagen da, so I guess it's, it is <laughs> Copenhagen. President Obama, along with other developed country leaders, pledged to raise $30 billion between 2010 and 2012 for fast start adaptation and mitigation efforts for countries most in need. Developed countries also committed to providing $100 billion annually by 2020 to developing nations, conditioned on all major economies agreeing to, and I quote, meaningful mitigation actions and full transparency as to their implementation. While the accord did not delineate precisely where the funds would come from or how they would be dispersed, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said funding would be deprived derived from public, private, bilateral, multilateral, and alternative sources. The commitments made by the developed world to developing nations were essential to achieving the Copenhagen Accord during the much anticipated 15th session of the Conference of the Parties. Negotiations nearly faltered until developed nations agreed to contribute resources to counter the effects of climate change in developing countries. As the Copenhagen Accord itself states, and I quote, enhanced action and international cooperation on adaptation is urgently required to ensure the implementation of the convention by enabling and supporting the implementation of adaptation actions aimed at reducing vulnerability and building resilience in developing countries, especially in those that are particularly vulnerable, especially least developed countries, small island developing states, and Africa, we agree that developed countries shall provide adequate, predictable, and sustainable financial resources, technology, and capacity building to support the implementation of ab adaptation action in developing countries." End of quote. Boy, that's a mouthful right there. The accord was an important step forward in achieving a legally binding global agreement to limit grass, uh, greenhouse <laughs> gas emissions, a step which is essential for avoiding the worst consequences of climate change. And while the pledges made by developing countries are substantial, they are both necessary and very much in our own interest. Ironically, the poorest countries, those that have contributed the least to global greenhouse gas emissions, will suffer 75 to 80 percent of the cost of climate change induced damages according to the World Development Report of 2010. Moreover, as Anthony Zinni, retired Marine Corps General and former commander of the U.S. Central Command, succinctly stated, and I quote, we will pay for this one way or another. We will pay to reduce greenhouse gases emissions today and we'll have to take an economic hit of some kind, or we will pay the price later in military terms. And that will involve human lives. There will be a human toil, a human toll, I'm sorry, end of quote. General Zini's views were confirmed by the 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review, which states that, and I quote, while climate change alone does not cause conflict, it may act as an accelerant of instability or conflict, placing a burden to respond on civilian institutions and militaries around the world. Extreme weather events may lead to increased demands for defense support 
to civil authorities for humanitarian assistance or disaster response both within the United States and overseas. Last week, I introduced House Resolution 1552, supporting finance for developing countries consistent with the Copenhagen Accords goals, calling for enactment of comprehensive energy and climate change legislation that includes provisions for international finance. Meanwhile, my good friend, Congressman Russ Carnahan from Missouri, is working on introducing the Global Climate Fund Act. That bill will lay out a pathway for distribution of funding for mitigation and adaptation based on the Copenhagen Accord and modeled after the successful global fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, which received essential U.S. financial support under the George W. Bush administration. In addition, Congressman Pete Stark introduced H.R. 5873, the Investment in Our Future Act, which would direct revenues from a small tax on all currency transactions involving U.S. persons to fund domestic child care programs and global health and climate change mitigation initiatives. These legislative efforts will help us meet the pledges of the Copenhagen Accord, provide essential assistance to the countries most vulnerable to climate change, and help avoid the mass mitigation, diminish, diminish food production, and competition over resources that could lead to conflict and instability requiring costly international response. Examples of the impact of developed countries' emissions on poorer countries can be found around the world, including the South Pacific, where my own home lies. As Ambassador Marlene Moses of Nauru has said, the Pacific Island developing states bear almost no responsibility for the onset of climate change, and yet we are suffering the consequences today. It is undermining our food security, water security, and territorial integrity. Climate change is a man-made disaster, and redress for the damage being done to our island nations is long overdue. We convene today's hearing as the Senate takes up energy legislation, albeit vastly diminished in scope from the Waxman-Markey bill that was passed last year by the House. Among many other issues, the Waxman uh, Markey bill included provisions for international finance. Senate legislation does not consider such funding, let alone a cap on green, greenhouse gas emissions. Indeed, as rolled out yesterday, the bill is simply focused on raising the liability caps on spills for oil companies and encouraging modest energy efficiency improvements. The Senate's bill, small bill, is discouraging for those of us committed to addressing climate change but we will not give up the fight, and I hope that today's hearing will contribute in some small way towards that effort. Today's hearing was organized by Melanie Mickelson Graham, a Presidential Management Fellow on rotation to the subcommittee from the Department of Energy. And I just want to note this personally, uh, Melanie is a specialist in energy and climate change in Asia. She has lived and traveled to China and is fluent in Mandarin. She previously worked with the Cohen Group in the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Senate, graduated with distinction from the NIT School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, received her bachelor's degree in economics with honors from my alma mater, Brigham Young University. She's also the proud mom of an active one-year-old boy who is learning Chinese. And we deeply appreciate the work that Melanie has done for this subcommittee and look forward to the testimonies from government officials and experts in the fields of climate change and finance who will share their thoughts on the Copenhagen Accord and on meeting its promises to raise and disperse funds for climate finance efficiently, effectively, and transparently. And given that we have eight witnesses testifying before us today, I could ask that you limit your testimony, please, to five minutes and submit your complete statements, which will be made for the record without objection. And I also ask the members to limit their opening statements and questions to five minutes each. My good friend, the ranking member from Illinois, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this hearing <clears throat> on foreign assistance funding for climate change and the UN, UN climate change negotiations. Uh, this is an issue that generates a lot of strong feelings on both sides, and I know your keen interest in this matter. I applaud your passion for tackling challenging problems under the subcommittee's jurisdiction. But 
this topic uh, has a lot of agreements and a lot of disagreements. Uh, the, current, the current problem of climate change through a massive cap and trade scheme and related energy tax will do little to prevent the harm that's occurring to people on a daily basis. When the House of Representatives passed the cap and trade legislation last year, supporters of that legislation included a thousand pages of new government spending and programs that failed to stop global pollution. I've long proposed that the best approach to addressing chemical pollutants is to attack the problem at its source. Work with foreign countries to stop emitting harmful pollutants into the atmosphere, the ground, and our water through practical and technical solutions. And unfortunately, the term climate change uh, only encompasses normally uh, what happens in the air and not on the ground and the water. These pollutants do not respect boundaries and have found their way into our food system. During the 110th Congress, I authored legislation to address this during the debate on the International Climate Reengagement Act and the Foreign Affairs Committee. Given the fragile state of our nation's economy, particularly the, particularly the unacceptably high unemployment rate, how could we seriously ask the American taxpayer to dig deeper into their pockets so that yet another government program gets funded? It's hard to tell good, hardworking Americans who have either lost their jobs or are in fear of losing them that borrowing money from China, which is now the world's largest consumer of energy and emitter of greenhouse gases, to provide climate change mitigation assistance to the, United, to the foreign nations is a good idea. The U.S. already provides over $23 billion a year on foreign assistance funding. Under the Obama administration, funding for climate assistance rose from $315 million in fiscal year 2009 to $1.3 billion in fiscal year 2010, and the fiscal year 2011 budget request for climate change assistance is over 40 percent above current levels to $1.9 billion. The unemployment rate in Rockford, the largest city that I represent, uh, is officially 16.1 percent, add 7 percent to that, uh, one out of four people are out of work. I know that cities across America are experiencing the same tragic job losses as my constituents are in Rockford. Policies such as cap and trade will do nothing other than to push America's already fragile manufacturing sector over the cliff. And it will do nothing to reduce global levels of greenhouse gas emissions because then other emerging economies will be doing the manufacturing in a less energy efficient manner that used to be done in our country. Thus, I want the American people to clearly understand that the intention of the administration and the majority party in Congress is to contribute more funding towards the UN's $200 billion Green Climate Fund. To underscore this point, the World Bank and Dutch Foreign Minister, Ministry sponsored a paper by renowned Yale economist Robert Mendelssohn confirming the largest threat to long-term economic growth is excessive near-term mitigation efforts. The report also notes that the total cost for mitigation could top $2 trillion. That's almost equal to the total amount of foreign assistance funding that the entire developed world spent in 50 years. The, um, and in this document, uh, Mendelssohn says, grim descriptions of the long-term consequences of climate change have given the impression that, climate, that the climate impacts from greenhouse gases threaten long-term economic growth. However, the impact of climate change on the global economy is likely to be quite small over the next 50 years. Severe impacts even by the end of the century are unlikely. The greatest threat that climate change poses to long-term economic growth is from potentially excessive near-term mitigation efforts. We are looking at a, at a uh, marathon and not a short sprint, and thus it's our duty to ensure that we do not waste precious resources. And I respect respectfully ask that this report be included in the record. Without objection, sir. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to welcome Dr. Redmond Clark to testify before the subcommittee. Dr. Clark is a constituent from Northern Illinois. It's an honor to have him here today. He's a business community leader who has real world insight on climate change, renewable energy, and global pollution, and he is my constituent, and thank you for calling the hearing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Illinois, my good friend, the gentleman from California, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, let's, let's just note it's a bit unnerving 
that we are here uh, at a time when we have such widespread economic hardship going on in our country and that we are seriously then talking about borrowing even more money from China in order to help other nations that might be affected by so-called man-made global warming. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I will hang up immediately. That person didn't like what I just said, I'm sure. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this, uh, even if the whole concept of global warming was not fraudulent, uh, we can't carry this burden for the whole world. Even, and, and I happen to believe, of course, that the premise that we're talking about is wrong. It just, it, I'm a senior member of the Science Committee. I've gone through hearing after hearing after on this, and it, uh, it is evident to me that there are prominent scientists throughout the world who totally disagree with this concept that humankind's uh, carbon dioxide emissions are going to make the world warmer and warmer and that it's going to have such a deleterious effect and is having a deleterious effect on the world. Uh, for the record, I would like to place the names of at least a hundred of the thousand prominent scientists, by the way, thousands of prominent scientists who put their names to uh, petitions suggesting that the concept of man-made global warming is not correct. Without objection. Thank you. And I would highlight three of these incredibly respected scientists who've been published in peer review research that contradicts the orthodoxy of man-made global warming. These scientists, by the way, these three scientists were in, recently included in a blacklist by the National Academy of Sciences scientists in a last-ditch desperation effort to save some vestige of their own credibility after the uh, revelations that we found recently uh, from purloined emails that uh, underscore and, and tend to prove that uh, there's been fraud involved in this whole effort. The first one is Freeman Dyson, who is a professor of physics at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and one of the world's most respected physicists. He's put on a blacklist for, for not going along with the man-made global warming theory. Frank Tipler, a professor of both mathematics and physics at Tulane University and one of the leading cosmo, uh, uh, cosmologists in the world. Uh, Roy Spencer, a climatologist uh, and a principal research scientist at the University of Alabama at Huntsville and through his decades of work at NASA is a leading expert in the use of satellites to measure temperature, the temperature of the Earth. Now, as you review the blacklist, it becomes very clear that these are leading experts uh, in every scientific and, and technological field, and they have been blacklisted because they disagree with the so-called consensus, which we hear every time when discussing global warming. It's the debate's over. Now, how many times have we heard that? Debate's over, case closed. Well, that is, for anybody who's heard that expression, which we have hundreds of times, let us note that it just underscores the fact that we have a con game going on and people want to shut off debate. And there has not been an honest debate on this issue. Uh, let us note that the purloined uh, emails that uh, were made public uh, just, uh, I guess, about six months ago now, uh, did demonstrate that, that uh, those climatologists, those researchers who, were, who had great, uh, who had very generous research grants, uh, both at East Anglica and their communication with researchers here, uh, had conducted themselves in a very unprofessional way. They had talked together about suppressing dissent. They talked about constructing data and building up uh, fraudul fraudulent claims against people who disagree with them. Uh, they actually used data that was based on idle speculation by graduate students rather than by research, especially when it came to glaciers retreating and, and uh, rain rainforests uh, that are... Uh, uh, and rainforests that are supposedly disappearing. Sometimes they actually use data and misrepresented it, wildly misrepresented it. And then there are actually uh, emails suggesting that they are going to hide and destroy data if asked for it by people who are questioning their results. Uh, this type of, of arrogance on the part of those engaged in, in global warming research should be an alarm bell for all of us. We should not be basing our policy uh, on this type of scientists who were benefited from major research grants and would do anything to protect their turf because that's the way, that's their rice bowl. 
uh, we should make sure that uh, we have an honest and open look at this issue before we commit billions and billions of dollars that should be going to help our own people uh, in order to give to other countries in order to balance off the effects of something that these scientists believe is not uh, uh, doesn't really exist and that's man-made global warming now I will then uh, I will yield back I don't have any more time but thank you very much for permitting me to at least inserting this part of the debate uh, when we're talking about these issues uh, into this discussion uh, it's important for us to note that this is not a fait accompli and that all people agree that man-made global warming is the threat that, that justifies some of the actions that are being advocated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman from California. And one thing I will say that over the years, my good friend from California and I have always uh, had a very healthy disagreement on certain issues. And uh, I never forgot in the years past, uh, I think he was very poetic in his uh, previous expression that global, global warming was global baloney or something to that effect. And I do respect my good friend's opinion. And uh, I've, it's unfortunate I hear that somebody blacklisted uh, uh, a group of scientists that may have a differing uh, view concerning global warming and climate change. And, uh, and the very reason why we're having this hearing this afternoon for an open debate. And uh, I, I thank the gentleman for his views and I hope he will stay here so that we will uh, have this interesting dialogue with some of our experts and witnesses and see how it will go. We have a very, very distinguished panel of uh, uh, experts, in my humble opinion, and they're given feel and to be with us this afternoon to share with us their sense of expertise and understanding of this issue before us. Uh, with us this afternoon is Dr. Leo Bernard, the Undersecretary for International uh, Affairs of the U.S. Department of Treasury, a position for which she was confirmed with the U.S. Senate. Dr. Brainard advances the administration's agenda of strengthening U.S. leadership in the global economy to foster growth, creative economic opportunities for Americans, and address it, transnational economic challenges, including development, climate change, food security, and financial inclusion. Most recently, Dr. Brainard was vice president and founding director of the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution, where she held the Bernard L. Schwartz Chair in International Economics and directed the Brookings Initiative on Competitiveness. Previously, Dr. Bernard was also Associate Professor of Applied Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, at the Sloan School of Management. Uh, Dr. Bernard received her master's and doctoral degrees in economics from Harvard Uni University, where she was a National Science Foundation Fellow. She graduated with highest honors from Wesleyan University. She is also the recipient of the White House Fellowship and a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship. With us also is Dr. Jonathan Pershing, the Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change at the U.S. Department of State. Dr. Pershing was appointed the Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change last year. In his capacity, he serves as the head of the delegation for the UN climate change negotiations. He reports to Special Envoy Todd Stern, responsible for U.S. international climate change policy. Prior to arriving at the State Department, Dr. Pershing was at the World Resources Institute, a nonprofit think tank where he headed the climate and energy programs and undertook research policy analysis and facilitated government, business, and NGO climate efforts both domestically and internationally. Dr. Pershing holds a PhD degree in geophysics, has worked as an oil geologist, not for BP, I hope, served as a faculty member of the American University and the University of Minnesota, and is the author of dozens of articles and a number of books on climate change and climate change policy. So there you go, Mr. Robrocker. I think we're gonna have a very good dialogue this afternoon. With us also is Rear Admiral David Tilley, the oceanographer and navigator of the U.S. Navy, a native of New York, Rear Admiral Tilley, was commissioned through the Naval Reserves Officers Training Commission in 1980, and uh, served several assignments uh, on uh, several ships. Admiral Tilley has uh, commanded the Fleet Numerical Meteor Meteorological and Oceanographic Center in Monterey, California. He's the first commanding officer of the Naval Oceanography Operations Command. He served his initial flag tour as commander, Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command. 
Served, uh, has had assignments in Pearl Harbor and Guam. Oh, very interesting. Rear Admiral Tilly also served as a U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, Special Assistant to the Chairman, retired James Watkins for Physical Oceanography and a Senior Military Assistant to the Director of Net Assessment in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, Admiral Tilly includes a, a bachelor's degree in meteorology from Penn State University, a master's in meteorology and physical oceanography, and a doctorate's degree in meteorology from the Naval Postgraduate School. I'm very, very uh, glad to have you, Admiral, to join us this afternoon. Last but not least, uh, Ms. Mara O'Neill. Dr. Mara O'Neill is the senior counselor to the administrator and chief innovation officer of the U.S. Agency for International Development or USAID. In public, private, and academic sectors, Dr. O'Neill is focused on creating entrepreneurial and public policy solutions for some of the toughest problems in the fields of energy, education, infrastructure financing, and business development. Before coming to USAID, she served as Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor to Energy and Climate at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and before that was Chief of Staff for the U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell in Washington State. Uh, Dr. O'Neill has started four companies in the field of energy, digital education, and high technology. Boy, this is quite a, Dr. O'Neill has served in, in MBAs from the, or received her MBAs from Columbia University, the University of California, Berkeley. Hey, hey, Berkeley, go Berkeley. Uh, and currently serves on the faculty of the Lester Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at UC Berkeley. Earned her doctorate at the University of Washington and currently now in that capacity as senior counselor of USAID. I'd like to have uh, Dr. Bernard to start us off for her testimony, and we'll just go down the line and see where we end. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Falio Mabainga, uh, Ranking Member uh, Manzullo, uh, Congressman uh, Rohrabacher. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss climate finance for vulnerable countries. In his national security strategy, President Obama highlighted the national security imperative of global climate change. With environmental degradation fueling instability and conflict, addressing climate change in developing countries protects our national security no less than it promotes our national interests and values. The President also noted there is no effective solution to climate change that does not depend upon all nations taking responsibility. Climate change is a global problem requiring a global solution. And climate and development are increasingly two sides of the same coin. Choices surrounding climate will greatly determine the fate of the poor, just as choices on the path out of poverty will greatly influence the fate of the climate. Let me make three brief observations about our work on climate and development, focusing on how Treasury directs and leverages multilateral financial tools to tackle these challenges. First, we believe U.S. investments in the multilateral climate trust funds are highly efficient, effective, and transparent. The funds are highly leveraged, ensuring a high return for U.S. taxpayer investments. By leveraging other donors, these funds maximize contributions, which amount to nearly $5 for every dollar the United States invests. Moreover, because these investments are centered in the multilateral development banks, we utilize our leadership of those institutions to mainstream climate change considerations into their core lending portfolios in addition to the trust funds, which is a force multiplier. This is most evident in the more than tripling of World Bank core lending for renewable energy and energy efficiency over the last five years from one billion to nearly 3.5 billion a year. In short, these are wise investments at a time when we are faced with difficult fiscal choices. The multilateralism of the funds also gives our contributions to them additional legitimacy. The cooperative and inclusive nature of those investments where developing countries sit on the governing boards are valued in international negotiations. And we design the funds to be innovative. They include country-owned plans, and flexible financing mechanisms. They catalyze private sector investment and civil society involvement, which means more traction, more scale, and more sustainability for the people they are intended to protect and serve, and they focus tightly on results and impact. Second, our investments in the multilateral climate trust funds strengthens the resilience of the most vulnerable nations. 
as this subcommittee recognizes the countries most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change have the least capacity to respond. Therefore, one of our primary policy goals of our climate financing must be to help these countries climate proof. The pilot program for climate resilience, for example, works to integrate climate adaptation into core development planning, coastal and water management, food security and production, risk management and early warning systems, and infrastructure adaptation. It does so in a number of the poorest countries and regions, including the South Pacific, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and the Caribbean, helping to restore livelihoods and protect against natural disasters. Third, our investments in these funds promote low carbon development by protecting forests and promoting clean energy. Since emissions from deforestation constitute about 17% of global greenhouse gas emissions, we must successfully protect forests if we are to successfully address climate change. The Forest Investment Program addresses the underlying causes of deforestation in places like Ghana that are especially dependent upon forest resources. The Tropical Forest Conservation Act forgives official debt owed to the U.S. in return for local in-country conservation activities in places like Indonesia. And in the area of clean energy, multilateral climate funds are focusing on spurring the development and deployment of energy efficiency and wind, solar, and geothermal technologies to help curb the growth of greenhouse gas emissions, spur private sector investment, and provide clean energy jobs into the future. The Clean Technology Fund catalyzes shifts to cleaner energy in emerging economies, while the Scaling Up Renewable Energy Program helps the poorest countries grow on a cleaner path. These activities supported our efforts to, to secure the deal in Copenhagen, where we had the experience and the credibility to talk about future financing arrangements, providing resources for the most vulnerable nations, and creating the Copenhagen Green Climate Fund in exchange for commitments to mitigation and transparency from key emerging countries like China. So in sum, congressional support of our efforts is vital to sustaining U.S. engagement leadership in the multilateral climate finance area. For fiscal year 2011, the administration requested $830 million for Treasury programs to strengthen resilience and promote low-carbon development. We welcome congressional support of this request, which will help to galvanize action on adaptation and on mitigation by developing countries and leverage burden sharing contributions from other countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernard. Dr. Pershing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Manzullo and Mr. Warbacher, thank you very much for taking the time for this hearing and your interest in this particular issue. The reasons for global change, in my mind, notwithstanding what Mr. Rohrbacher has suggested, I think are quite clear. In spite of the minority views of a very few skeptics, the global community is in broad agreement that left unchecked. Climate change would lead to very dramatic shifts in the way the world lives. We understand that it will lead to significant population displacement from sea level rise, that it will lead to a decline in global food supply, that it will lead to massive losses in species biodiversity, and to major shortages of water. These are quite fundamental elements of the way the economies of the world work. And to solve this problem, we have to shift the way the economy works to a low carbon structure. And we need to move pretty quickly if we want to avoid the kinds of damages that are anticipated. And unfortunately, we're a bit late in getting going. And so we're gonna have to develop strategies to adapt to the change that we already see and the anticipated change that will occur in the future. While we know what needs to be done, we also know that there are limits to the capacity, particularly in developing countries, and specifically among the most vulnerable and the poorest. These countries are going to need assistance to change their development trajectories and to adapt to the unavoidable consequences of climate change. To this end, of course, all nations need to rapidly and substantially ramp up domestic investment. The wealthier countries are going to have to do some work providing new financing, along with technical and technological assistance to encourage new private investment in, more, in a more sustainable future. It's unsurprising that mitigation and adaptation, as well as financing to help poor countries deal with both, have been the central themes in the Copenhagen Accord. And I note that no deal would have been possible without both elements. First, on the action side. All major economies in Copenhagen, both developed and developing, 
committed to take actions to limit their emissions, to list those actions in appendices to the agreement, and committed to implement those actions in an internationally transparent manner. To date, 136 countries have associated with the accord, and more than 75, including all the major economies, have inscribed domestic targets or actions. We United States have to do our part. Second, the agreement included provisions for significant new financial assistance in the context of action by all major economies. And there were three elements in these financing components. First, Developed countries committed to provide short-term, fast-start finance approaching $30 billion over the period 2010 to 2012 to support adaptation and mitigation in developing countries. It is vitally important for our overall climate diplomacy goals and for the credibility of the accord that the United States make a strong contribution to fast-start finance. The President's fiscal year 2010 budget and the 2011 budget request puts us on track to meet our share, and we thank you here in the House for your support of the past budget and look forward to your support for the 2011 budget. Second, a global goal of mobilizing long-term public and private finance of $100 billion per year by the year 2020, again, in the context of meaningful action on mitigation and transparency in implementation. It's a package, it's part of the deal. The goal must be seen for what it is, a catalytic effort to help jumpstart the world onto a pathway to a cleaner economy. It's a large figure, but the shift to a low-carbon global economy will only result from private investments in clean and sustainable energy and economic growth. This is a catalytic effort. And third, we've agreed to establish a new Copenhagen Green Fund, and Under Secretary Brainerd spoke about it. The UN Convention already has one financial operating entity, the Global Environment Facility, to which the US is a donor. And where the GEF, the GEF, might focus more on capacity building, the new fund could concentrate on financing larger scale mitigation and adaptation investments. Overall, our finance is divided among multilateral initiatives and institutions, as well as bilateral programs and activities. The balance provides us with maximum value leveraging contributions in the global community and multiplying our finance, as Under Secretary Brainerd suggested, and on the bilateral side, as Maura O'Neill is likely to speak to, targeting key allies, promoting specific initiatives, generating the most value in the policy arena. Let me leave you with a couple of points in closing. In our view, the US and the world must act quickly and aggressively to curb our emissions if we're to avoid the most damaging effect of climate change. A key element will be robust action here at home. For that, we'll need a combination of legislation, regulation, American ingenuity, and investment. At the same time, we must assist the world's poorest and most vulnerable people to adapt to the effects of climate change and help support developing countries in setting low emissions and sustainable development pathways that are resilient to a changing climate. And finally, I believe that taking domestic and international action are not choices we can politely turn down. Rather, they represent both an opportunity and a responsibility. We look forward very much to working with you here in Congress as we take on this task. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Percy. Admiral Tilley. Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman uh, Manzullo, uh, Congressman Rohrabacher, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you today regarding climate change in the military. I'm uh, Rear Admiral Dave Titley, and I'm the oceanographer of the Navy, director of the Navy's Task Force on Climate Change. Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Gary Ruffhead, established Task Force on Climate Change in May of 2009 to address implications of climate change for national security and naval operations. Today I'm speaking about the impacts of climate change on the Navy. Rather than read from my written statement, I'd just like to provide some introductory remarks on the topics and then invite any questions. The 2008 National Defense Authorization Act, 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review, and 2010 National Security Strategy all require the Department of Defense to take action regarding climate change by recognizing the effects climate change may have on the operating environment, roles, missions, facilities, and military capabilities. Taking into account this guidance, the Navy recognizes the need to adapt to climate change and is closely examining the impacts that climate change will have on military missions and infrastructure. The Navy is watching the changing Arctic environment with particular interest. The changing Arctic has national security implications for the Navy. 
The Navy's maritime strategy identifies that new shipping routes have the potential to reshape the global transportation system, possibly generating sources of competition for access and natural resources. For example, the Bering Strait has the potential to increase in strategic significance over the next few decades, and China is actively exploring ways to increase its presence in the Arctic. There are other impacts of climate change on missions that the Navy must consider, including water scarcity and fisheries redistribution that may influence future Navy missions regarding humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Conversely, some areas of the world, such as Russia, may benefit from longer growing seasons and an increase in water availability, providing opportunities for economic growth. Large-scale redistribution of fisheries is a concern in areas of the world that depend heavily upon this industry as a primary food source. The Navy must understand where, when, and how climate change and its silent cousin, ocean acidification, will affect regions around the world and work to build resilience and partnerships with foreign militaries. The Navy must also be aware of impacts to military infrastructure, both within and outside the continental United States due to increased sea level rise and storm surge. The Navy's operational readiness hinges on continued access to land, air, and sea training and test spaces, and many overseas bases provide strategic advantage to the Navy in terms of location and logistics support. Any adaptation efforts undertaken are required to be informed by the best possible science and initiated at the right time and cost. The Navy is currently beginning assessments for areas of major potential funding that will inform Navy strategy, policy, and plans to guide future investments. The Department of Defense is already conducting adaptation efforts through a variety of activities, including two Navy roadmaps on the Arctic and global climate change and the leveraging of cooperative partnerships to ensure best access to science and information. The Navy understands the challenges and opportunities that climate change presents to its missions and installations. We are beginning to conduct the assessments necessary to inform future investments and are initiating adaptation activities in areas where we have enough certainty with which to proceed. Thank you, sir, and I stand ready to answer any sub, uh, questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Admiral. Dr. McNeil. O'Neill, I'm sorry. Thank you. Chairman uh, Paleo Movega, um, Ranking Member Manzullo, and Congressman Orbach, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. I will briefly summarize my written testimony, um, which I've asked to be submitted for the record. Without yeah. objection, all your statements will be made part of the record, and if you have any additional materials you want to also be include to be made part of the record, you're more than welcome to do so. Great. I'm pleased to be here today with my colleagues from State, Navy, and Treasury. Our agencies work closely to ensure a robust um, response on the part of the U.S. government to the critical threat of global climate change. In my role as senior counselor to the administrator and chief innovation officer, I've been working with the agency's significant technical expertise to spearhead our approach to innovative um, climate financing. Climate change is one of the century's greatest challenges, and low carbon, Climate resilient growth must be a priority for our diplomacy and development work for years to come. Climate change is not just an environmental problem, but a problem with huge human consequences of hunger, poverty, conflict, water scarcity, infrastructure integrity, sanitation disease, and survival in the region, as well as U.S. security. It is imperative to address climate change in Asia and the South Pacific. Over half of the Asia's four billion people live near the coast, and about 87% of the world's small-scale farmers um, operate in Asia. They are susceptible to sea level rise, stronger cyclones, changes in monsoon patterns, and either too much or too little water. And the small island states of the Pacific are among the world's most vulnerable to climate change. The small size of the islands and the concentration of their economies into a few climate sensitive activities such as tourism and fishing limit the adaptation options of many of these states. However, by improving the management of the limited fishery and other resources and reducing the stresses within the island's control, the resilience can be greatly improved and with it the lives and livelihoods of the people. USAID's expertise in agriculture, water, biodiversity, health, and other climate-sensitive sectors provide an opportunity to implement innovative cross-sectorial climate change programs in partnership with these countries. 
Together with state and treasury, USAID's climate programs are budgeted according to three climate um, change pillars, adaptation, clean energy, and sustainable landscapes. We received $308 million in FY10 appropriations and have requested $491 million for these efforts in FY11 and appreciate your support. USAID is especially attuned to the unique threat small island developing states and other coastal areas face. We've developed tools for assessing their vulnerability and adaptation options at the national and local levels. For example, recently we worked with a Marshall Islands um, group developing a guidebook for development planners to help them identify areas in which they are most vulnerable to extreme weather events. The Asia-Pacific region is of particular importance in conversations about climate impacts because of the vast wealth of highly sensitive coral reefs. These are the among the most vulnerable ecosystems due to threats from rising surface temperatures and sea levels, increasing frequency of storm surges and ocean acidification. Healthy and resilient coral reefs are vital to the well-being of many small island states and communities, contributing to the food security of over one billion people around the world. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the coral reefs are a critical spawning habitat for tuna and other profitable fisheries in the region. The United States was the first donor to support the Coral Triangle Initiative for coral reefs, food security, and climate change, and provide early and sustained support to this diplomatic and development initiative. Investment by the private sector in the developing world, including foreign direct investment, plays a dominant role in whether these countries will have the infrastructure and economic basis to prosper or be damaged by climate fluctuations. USAID seeks innovative approaches to, um, to climate change that draw upon scientific research technologies and strengthen partnerships with the private sector. We have a, no, uh, a number of ongoing efforts which I'd be happy to um, elaborate either in this hearing or in follow-up. In Indonesia in particular, we are creating an innovative public-private partnership to develop new business opportunities that scale throughout the country and create good business and employment income for local people. Um, US Administrator, USAID Administrator Shaw, whether it's in his strategic direction on food security our governance and stability work, or economic development assistance, has conveyed the importance to all of us of reducing emissions and increasing the climate resilience of our partner countries. He knows that the countries in which we work and the people who live there are the most vulnerable in the world to adverse effects. In closing, I'd like to emphasize the seriousness with which we view this threat, both to U.S. national interests and to the prosperity of our future country partners around the world, and the commitment we bring to the efforts to mitigate the worst impacts and improve resiliency of the most vulnerable. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any other questions. I thank uh, the members of the panel for their most eloquent statements. Before I, uh, I uh, turn the time over to my colleagues for their questions, I just want to get a sense of consensus. Do I get a strong feeling or impression that all of you are very much uh, in support of the cl this climate change crisis that we're faced with? Uh, not necessarily supportive, but recognize that there is such a thing as climate change. Is that a better term? I'm, I'm not sure I would call it a crisis. It is certainly a strategic challenge. Uh, it is a challenge that we, we have to understand better. It's always easy when looking back to say whether something was or was not. Okay, so you're saying it with qualification. I'm going to let my colleagues uh, do the direct questions. Gentleman from Illinois for his questions. Dana, we'll uh, switch a little bit. I'll have my good friend go first. from California <laughs> to uh, do some uh, grilling All right. here. All right. Uh, All right, Dana, it's your turn. Admiral, uh, you mentioned the change that's taking place in the uh, uh, Arctic and the uh, waters there are now nav navigable. Uh, has that ever happened before in history? It has not happened in the recorded history. If you talk to the... Uh, tribal elders who were, were up there. I had the opportunity to ride the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Healy last year, mm -hmm. and they had uh, some of the tribal elders on board. Uh, they said in their oral history, which were they Eskimos? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, when you say tribal elders, who are, who's the name uh, of the tribe? Y yes, sir, the, nat the native uh, tribes. Inuits? Uh, Eskimos, or? Yes, sir. Eskimo? Or mm -hmm. Okay. 
and uh, uh, from uh, from the Barrow area of uh, of Alaska, uh, they in their time did not know of the time when the Arctic was navigable. So that goes back, they said, about ten thousand years. Okay. So and ten thousand years is uh, relatively short in in the history of the world, of course, but um, at times there we had. Uh, I know that the, the case of Greenland and Iceland, where there were dramatic changes, we had, uh, uh, for example, when we talk about adaptation of different peoples, uh, there were large populations in Greenland and Iceland, and they were farmers at one point, and uh, uh, that changed, did it not? It became, at some point, it became not navigable anymore for people to live in Iceland, isn't that correct? There were certainly times in which people have lived uh, in Iceland and Greenland. They continue to live there to this day. Uh, also, I believe what you're referring to perhaps is the medieval warming period, sir? Well, actually, I'm referring to the uh, period of the cooling that happened after the global warm, uh, the, uh, Europe, the, the medieval warming period. And I'm glad that you recognize the, that there was a medieval warming period because as we know, uh, one of the fraudulent attempts by the uh, head researchers of uh, this global warming effort uh, was trying to erase that from the charts, that there had actually been a warming period and how high and how, what level of temperature that raised to, because if indeed there was a warming back in medieval times, it would be hard then to suggest that it was uh, modern technology or carbon-related en energy that was creating the change in the weather. Um, uh, Dr. Pershing, do you discount people like, I mean, you just sort of discard Richard Linson, and, uh, uh, who is a, one of the most distinguished scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and these other thousands of scientists who've signed, you just sort of, uh, they're just a, a few skeptics, I think is what you call them? You don't pay attention to their arguments at all? You just sort of brush them aside? Uh, thank you. No, I, I don't brush them aside. I've done a fair amount of work with Dr. Lindzen. Uh, I, I've had a number of opportunities to interact with him. Mm -hmm. uh, my sense about it is that uh, there are elements of his analysis that are certainly worth considering. He's done some of the best cloud seeding theory that's out there. Collectively, it's one of the unknown issues about the details. But on the basic issue, I think that he's wrong. Mm -hmm. And my own sense about it is that the other scientists who you've been citing represent a very small minority. I would say several things about it. I know that you commented in your opening remarks uh, about the language coming out of East Anglia. Uh, there have been a series of analyses done by the research community, both of the university and of others, and they have concluded resoundingly that there was no malfeasance, that there was perhaps an inappropriate, inadequate release of data. And on that context, I think we should be very careful mm -hmm. to hold the scientific community accountable to be transparent. Okay. But there's a at different point, model here about the adequacy right. of the results. Thank you. At this point, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to place in the record a, uh, or a uh, column that was written uh, for the Wall Street Journal Without objection. Uh, about the point that was just made by our witness on uh, the uh, supposed uh, investigation into East Anglica, where it points out that this so-called uh, uh, investigation into the charges uh, was done by people who they themselves had benefited from many of the research grants that they were they, they themselves investigating, and also that they neglected to call anyone to, as a witness who was a critic of those people who were being charged with wrongdoing. So I would submit this for the record at this point. Uh, how much, let me just note that what we've heard is time and again even today is we talk about climate change, right? First of all, we all remember that for, for a decade it was global warming and now it's climate change. But even that isn't adequate to, to really lay the foundation. What we're really talking about is man-made climate change, because there's been climate change throughout the history of the world. I mean, I'm sorry, just trying to get that with the Admiral. Clearly, we've had cycles of warming and cooling throughout, and the only question is, is whether or not, as is being proposed to us by this very, what I consider to be, fanatic click of, of scientists who have big research grants is that it is mankind's production of carbon dioxide that is causing this particular change in the climate. And up until nine years ago, the word was always global warming, but then it started getting cooler for a number of years, so they had to change it to climate change. Uh, Mr. Chairman, 
People have always had to adapt to changes in climate. And that's why when we hear the testimony from some of our witnesses, I'm not, uh, all I'm doing is calling into question basically the premise that humankind is causing this. We are going through a period of change in our climate just as we have in the past. It does not then justify the dramatic controls and taxation uh, that is, are being proposed by this administration, but it does suggest that we should be working with peoples, uh, vulnerable peoples, to help them adapt to as the climate changes. Uh, not that we can change, that climate will continue to change throughout our history. So as we go through this hearing today, I think that we should be, uh, uh, I would be in agreement with those who are saying, how do we, how do we adapt? Not how do we confront a change in, in the climate of the earth and how mankind's gonna uh, change the weather patterns. And uh, that uh, uh, that's, is ridiculous. But there, it is very substantial. Uh, when we talk, when the Admiral talks about the changes in the uh, Arctic, and, and as you're fully aware and have made many times, the changes in, in what's going on among island life in the Pacific and, and various peoples who live along the oceans. But uh, let's focus on, uh, I would suggest that the best way is to focus on adaptation rather than trying to think that we're going to halt the uh, climate uh, evolutions, evolutionary processes that have been going on uh, for millions of years. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman from California. Gentleman from Illinois. Well, I thought we'd get that out of the way at the beginning. So, <laughs> thank you, Chairman. The uh, Dr. Yo, let, let me ask you a question. Um, Let's say that you were uh, ambivalent on the question of whether or not the, the Earth is warming, okay? And in other words, you, you didn't take an opinion one way or the other on it. Um, I look at your suggestions and your testimony. Am I incorrect in assuming that even if you had that view, you would still um, uh, promote many of the programs and, and uh, adapta adaptations that you state in your testimony? Con Thank you, Congressman. There's clearly extreme weather conditions, and um, as you say, one could debate um, uh, exactly the causes, et cetera, but Asia and the island nations in particular are extremely vulnerable. And so, yes, we would support um, the adaptation work and, um, and the planning work that goes on to assess that, to plan, and to put these nations in the best position to be climate resilient, or as Under Secretary Brainerd says, climate proof their economies. The, um, because I, I'm looking at page three of your testimony, um, and you talk about, let me see, new approaches to, convers uh, to, um, uh, to, to conservation, uh, including uh, GMOs on, on crops. Is that, am I reading that correctly? genetically modifying crops to withstand heat and insects and things of that nature? We do believe that new varieties of um, drought resistant um, agriculture is one of the key adaptation um, efforts uh, available to uh, not only the U.S. but the rest of the world that can be quite effective. So the answer would be yes? Yes. Okay. I, I, I find that encouraging. I, I guess what I'm trying to, in the midst of of this debate that's going on, uh, and, and with all deference to, to my colleague, uh, I don't think a person has to arrive at a decision as to whether or not global warming is in fact occurring uh, to, to come to the conclusion that we have to do everything possible uh, to stop global pollution, regardless of the impact that, that one uh, may see from it. Would you agree with that statement? I would agree. Um, and um, as I, I shared uh, before we started, my brother's in, deeply involved in anti-litter, uh, organized an entire county of, 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 of cleaning that up and, and that doesn't go into the waters, et cetera. Uh, I was just in Jordan last year 
uh, where they're having a lot of problems with the, the plastic uh, grocery bag that they now call the Jordanian state flower. And I'm not trying to insult my friends in the plastic industries, but I, I'm trying to find a way here where the emphasis can be upon uh, remediation uh, or accommodation of, of attacking global pollution on a nonpartisan, non uh, uh, theoretical level, but simply recognizing that all the stuff we put in the air and bury um, and, uh, and put into the waters somewhere along the line is going to have a significant impact. To add something? Sure. Um, so, yes, I think you're absolutely right. And I also believe that in addition to um, GMOs or technology, we also have the opportunity to identify existing native plants or existing hybrids that actually perform much better under a range of climate conditions. So I think that both in terms of new discoveries, but also existing discoveries are out there for us to help um, with this uh, challenge. Admiral Tilly, would you like to comment on that? And could you straighten out your mic so it's a little bit closer to your mouth there? Thank you. What, uh, what the Navy is working on on their task force climate change, and, and I should mention that when, when I say the Navy's working on this, we're working with over 125 other uh, in, uh, federal agencies, international partners, academic partners, uh, NGOs. Uh, is, is primarily adaptation. It's, it's kind of what you, you said, sir, in that whether or not you believe or don't believe climate change is occurring, what we do see, the data tells us, not the models, not theory, but the observations are telling us that there are some very, very significant changes going on in the Earth's uh, Earth-ocean-atmosphere system. And it would frankly be negligent for the Navy not to plan for future contingencies or future states of the world uh, if, if we just assume that all of a sudden the changes are just going to stop in 2010 or 2011. So we, we are, are taking a look at these multiple types of adaptation. Uh, where can we work with partners? Uh, the Quadrennial Defense Review states that in many countries, uh, the militaries, foreign militaries, are perhaps the one component of a, of a country that really has the capacity and capability to adapt. So just uh, right now, I mean, the United States Navy is working with Cambodia, with Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand. Uh, we've done visits in Palau, uh, Papua New Guinea, all at building partnerships. And those partnerships can, when and if required, lead to uh, mutual cooperation on adaptation for climate change. Dr. Pershing, you want to tackle that question? Yes, thank you very much. I think there are two pieces that I'd just like briefly to speak to. The first one is that, that I certainly uh, agree with the Admiral and with, with Dr. O'Neill that there is a component that has a value both for climate and, and for local changes. And we can speak to both of them on the adaptation side. So I think there's not really a question about that. But I want to come back a bit to the diplomatic side because clearly we are also immersed in a diplomatic conversation with countries around the world in the context of international negotiation. And on that side, climate change is actually the basis for it. And if we are not acting on that basis as well as on other bases, we will be accused of gross negligence, of inadequate performance, and there are consequences to that. So there's got to be, I think, some balance achieved. Well, I, I, let me, I mean, the issue is pollution. I mean, pollution is what, what causes this, correct? I think the issue is more complicated than we think of in terms of criteria pollutants like sulfur and nitrogen. Well, I mean, it, it's something that's going into the air, the ground, or, 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 or the waters that may or may not be causing the change in the climate. Is that correct? That's in correct. your opinion. And, and so my question is, I mean, it, it, it's the politics of polarization, I think, is very, uh, is very hurtful here. I agree with uh, that. And I, I'm, not, I'm not being critical of you. I'm, I'm just trying to find, and, and, and not a middle ground, but there are a lot of us that are very concerned uh, about global pollution. I mean, at one time, ships used to dump their waste, and I mean, you know, the, the stories, and now, they're, uh, now they have uh, equipment on the ships uh, that discharge clean water, et cetera. But I, I, 
I interrupted you. And I wanted to let uh, Under Secretary Brainerd also have a stab at that question. No, I was going to say I think that's completely correct, sir. And my sense is that in the larger context of what we do, I think that we need to be bold and look at the opportunities for coexisting benefits on climate, on security, on food and climate, on pollution and climate. There are a set of these pieces. But I'm not clear that if we only do those pieces, we would do enough on the climate side. Okay. And I think that's a piece we have to consider more extensively. Under Secretary Brainerd, do you want to tackle that? I, uh, I appreciate very much that um, I'm hearing from uh, all of um, the uh, distinguished members uh, here uh, that there is a common concern, um, how, however we frame it, about helping the poorest countries uh, become more resilient to pollution of our climate. I mean, if that is a common ground, um, I think the question that we are all very seized with is how best uh, to work with other donors, to work with uh, nations that are vulnerable to the effects of pollution of, of the climate, um, of climate change, uh, to steer a course into the future uh, that makes them more resilient, that uh, allows them um, to uh, adapt their food uh, production systems, to uh, engage in um, much more effective disaster preparedness, um, to grapple with a whole host of existential threats that uh, they are uh, likely to confront into the future. Um, I also think it's very important um, for us uh, to work to move our economy and the major economies um, of the world onto greener development paths. And so the tools uh, that you um, are focusing on here in this hearing today, I think are the right focus. How most effectively do we leverage very scarce resources uh, to get the international commitment to action on the part of some of the largest emerging economies, um, which um, my colleague um, from the State Department is, is very focused on? how best uh, to um, leverage assistance to help developing countries steer uh, a path into the future that is less prone to conflict and more promising, uh, both for their people but also uh, for our national interests here. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Thank my colleagues for their questions. Uh, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions myself, and I would like to uh, present this to the members of the panel. <clears throat> Obviously, we... Uh, in our own country, we have some very tough economic times, and uh, how do I explain to my constituents that we should be adding to the U.S. federal deficit to send money abroad to our industrial competitors in this regard? How do we justify increasing the deficit by giving more money to help our competitors if we're to address seriously the question of climate change? Dr. Brainer? For the most part, um, the the um, clean energy programs that we're investing in uh, through the Clean uh, Technology Fund, um, through the multilateral development banks more generally, are really designed to address the needs of developing countries uh, as they move on to uh, cleaner energy paths. They're really not um, providing financing to industrial competitors uh, in any direct way. Um, what we are doing is building legitimacy in the international community by helping those nations that need the most help, uh, charting uh, a more climate resilient uh, and a greener path into the future, uh, and building um, agreement among those uh, fastest growing emerging markets that they too, uh, as they did in the Copenhagen Accord for the first time, need to take on commitments to reduce uh, their carbon emissions, commitments that are verifiable uh, by the international community. So what we're, what we're trying to do uh, is invest in climate resilience on the part of the poorest countries, invest in mitigation on the part of a set of developing countries who are moving on to cleaner energy paths, but build international legitimacy to get other of the fastest growing emerging markets uh, to take meaningful actions, which of course we will be taking here uh, as well. Dr. Pershing. Yes, thank you very much. I, I think that's the question that I've also heard when I've been around the country and having conversations with people. I, I think there are two answers that are also compelling in addition to ones that, that Dr. Brainerd suggested. The first is that there is a cost to inaction. 
and the cost comes in the context of climate change that continues and in all the things that it brings with it. When we tend to look at the world, we say, well, if I don't pay anything now, what's the alternative going to look like? If nothing were to change, then my cost is a sunk cost with no value. But if I can prevent a damage, and that's a great deal of what I think we try to do in the government collectively, is to manage damages and manage risks, then I have a clear value. So that's the very first point. And the second one has to do with what kinds of investments are we making, and where do they go, and can they redound to our benefit and our credit? And this is very much what I think Mr. Manzullo had suggested earlier in his question. Are there aspects of the things that we are doing that we'll start with that are good for our economy, that create jobs for us at home, that create political and diplomatic initiatives and tie-ins that we seek? I think the answer is yes. If we can reduce the cost of energy around the world by lowering the price of solar, that's good for us as well as the world. If we can change the dynamics and the food issues that Dr. O'Neill was speaking to, that's good for the world by reducing security risks where there's tensions over food quality. The same for water, the same for disease. There's a set of those things which I think are part of the puzzle as well that we can address. Transparency is always a beautiful word when we talk about the ability of governments to function. There was a recent report that our government, had, I think, was a, a waste of about $100 billion that we cannot account for. This is in our own government. This is not having to go and tell other countries how, how terrible they've been operating their systems of government. Within our own government, $100 billion of waste. Uh, that's not pennies. And I was wondering, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, I want to get Admiral Tilly and uh, Dr. O'Neill to, their response to the question that I raised. Just uh, v very, very briefly, sir, uh, I would absolutely uh, concur with, uh, with Dr. Dr. Pershing's uh, response there. Uh, whenever our country spends money, we need to understand what its return on that investment is, be it, uh, be it for security, be it, for, uh, be it for, for social means, be it for whatever. Uh, the maritime strategy our, our Navy's maritime strategy states that preventing wars is as important as winning them. Uh, make no mistake, our Navy uh, will prevail in any kind of conflict, but it's very, very important that we prevent wars. As the Quadrennial Defense Review states that uh, climate change can be an accelerant to instability, uh, it, it's therefore just logical that we would want to take a look at how can we minimize or lessen uh, that potential to uh, or decrease that, uh, that accelerant, if you will, uh, minimize the, the, insta in uh, the destabilizing impacts of, uh, of climate change. Uh, nobody, nobody wants additional conflicts, least of all anybody inside the Department of Defense. Uh, so, so it just makes sense that we would look at all options all options to, uh, to minimize the chance of conflict over, over something that, uh, whose cause could be climate change. Dr. O'Neill, I know you uh, are our expert this afternoon about our foreign assistance programs. We love to give money away to foreign countries, sometimes even to those countries that spit at us. And I was just wondering in terms of, of your understanding, uh, this proposed funding for the addressing this issue of climate change is fully justifiable. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, say that, that uh, I would second most of what, uh, if not all of what my distinguished panelists have said, so rather than repeat it, I would just add one note that hasn't been discussed yet, and that is that uh, developing countries represent one of the most important emerging markets for U.S. goods and services. And so to the extent that uh, these, um, countries are functioning, that people are being fed, that economies are working. It I didn't mean to interrupt you, but by what, uh, some 192 countries that we have in, that make up the United Nations, how many are least developed countries? What's, what's the number, uh, with the total number of countries before the UN at about 195 or 198, how many are LDCs? Anybody have that We number? operate um, in 80 countries around the world and have um, non-presence relationships with about 20 others. Dr. Pershing? Yes, I, I think it's about 50 countries technically in the UN system are titled least developed countries. Okay. And, uh, and would I be correct in saying that least developed countries is also identified as developing countries? Oh yes, the least developed tend to be about a dollar a day of income. 
is it one of the biggest problems too that we have in if we're ever going to provide this funding is the transparencies of these, these developed countries. Some of these countries spend more money on their military budgets than they do in actually giving help uh, to, to its citizens. And I wonder how do we justify giving them money if, they, uh, if the leaders turn around and spend it for, for non uh, programs that uh, don't provide for the needs of the people. Dr. Reynard and then Dr. Bush. Yeah, just for um, most of these countries, um, when we are providing them uh, climate financing, um, we also uh, normally have multilateral programs with them through the multilateral development banks, through the World Bank, um, through the regional development banks, and uh, also often uh, with the IMF. We get, um, as a result of that, uh, there's a lot of safeguards that are put around uh, that financing. They are generally placed in the context of overall governmental budgets, uh, and there's uh, auditing um, and transparency requirements, uh, procurement requirements. There are a whole host of safeguards that we've built up through the multilateral institutions uh, over the years that gives us a um, of a high degree of assurance, not a complete a degree of assurance, but very high degree of assurance uh, that we can see that these funds do go to the adaptation programs uh, that uh, they are intended um, to fund uh, and that they are additional to other efforts and that more broadly uh, these are programs that the governments themselves and the people themselves are committed to um, and it is a priority of those governments. So. We have a broader um, architecture of assistance and engagement, diplomatic engagement, uh, engagement through uh, USAID, as well as uh, through the multilateral uh, development institutions, so that these uh, funds go into um, environments where we're broadly engaged with the governments on increasing transparency and effectiveness of our development funds. Dr. Bush. No, that was excellent. I wouldn't add anything to that. Are, are we realistic enough to suggest that by the year 2020 that uh, we can come up with $100 billion in funding for this climate change program, uh, given the deficit problems we're having right now in our, in our country? I'm not an economist, so you're going to have to help me on this. So I think, as uh, Dr. Pershing was saying uh, earlier, um, the size of the um, likely investments to transition to a greener economy worldwide is, is a large uh, multiple of that number. And the 100 billion number uh, itself, uh, I think it's very important to recognize that that is a combination of public sources, but also importantly, we think the majority will be coming from private investment. And that is why it's so critically important for us to be able to enable those market mechanisms to send the right price signals to ensure that investments, private investments, are going to be the primary mechanism for moving us all on to greener uh, development paths. Public financing will be very important, uh, particularly in the area of uh, adaptation, um, but will not, uh, we don't foresee be the majority. Uh, the other thing that I think is very important is uh, to remember that uh, the point of working with other countries in the multilateral context, in the context of the Copenhagen Accord, is the burden sharing. Um, so this is not a burden that we plan to shoulder alone. We plan to shoulder it with other um, countries who have capacities and only in return for verifiable actions on the part of some of the largest developing emitters. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to leave. We have a vote on. That's all right. I thank you very much for this hearing. I'm sorry I won't be able to do any more. Just uh, one point, uh, pollution. Uh, I, I have always said that global pollution should be the focus of our efforts. However, let us note that uh, where we disagree and uh, where Dr. Pershing and I disagree and these other very prominent scientists is whether or not CO2 is a pollutant, the CO2 that we pump into our greenhouse houses in California to grow bigger plants and things that CO2 does not hurt human beings. Uh, uh, that uh, focus on those other pollutants, we have an agreement. Focus on CO2, uh, that's another matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No problem, Dana. I think given the back to the basic arguments that we made since the time of the Kyoto Protocols, uh, to such an extent that by a vote of 93 to 0 in our own U.S. Senate rejecting the Kyoto Protocols about uh, the climate change issue, 
how serious is it in the private sector to realize that uh, the more uh, demands we made in the private sector about gas emissions and all of this, that's really going to cause an economic chaos in our own economic, uh, in our own economy. Is that true? I mean, is there, is there really a serious problem where the private sector community corporations and uh, industries are going to be so, uh, uh, you know, they're just not going to operate properly uh, because of the uh, expectations and demands made by this uh, climate change issue? Let me just um, speak briefly um, that I think uh, the president um, has been very, uh, I think, compelling on this point. I think the large majority, actually, of businesses here in the U.S. Uh, agree with this perspective, that the country that figures out how to produce um, and distribute energy in the cleanest possible ways, that country is going to be the most competitive nation uh, of the next century, and that for the U.S., uh, it's critically important uh, for us to be that nation, um, to be the most innovative, the most focused on cleaner energy, mm. uh, more cost-effective cleaner energy into the future, and so it's a huge competitiveness opportunity for us. In order to get from here to there, we need to make sure that the investment environment um, is uh, rewarding uh, investments in those technologies of tomorrow, that the price signals are there. So I think there's been a, a huge change uh, in our business community, and they are clamoring to be um, able to uh, take a full part uh, in the opportunities presented by the transition uh, to a uh, greener uh, future. Well, this seems to be the other, re the other reason why the other body has had a very difficult time working on this climate change issue, simply because the... Uh, Corporate community uh, just feel that uh, uh, that uh, there's too much uh, regulations, uh, too many demands made to them to the point where they can't make a reasonable profit, and so therefore kill it. And uh, now we end up with a uh, with a stalemate uh, situation in the Senate, uh, and of course their rules are quite different from ours. So it's it's you know it's a here and there. This is what makes our democracy very unique. Dr. Pershing, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, thank you. I, I wanted just to add one more point to the one that was just made, which uh, has to do a little bit with certainty in the environment. Because when I speak and we try on a regular basis to engage with the private community in our negotiations as an ongoing process, we do regular briefings to make sure people know where the administration is going, how the process is working. And there's been two consistent messages that have come back. The first one is that over the long term, they do expect you to act. They expect Congress to act, the United States to have laws in place that would move us to a lower carbon economy. And they look at the rest of the world and see the rest of the world acting. And the consequence of our inaction and other action is a degree of investment uncertainty, which they're regularly concerned about. They come back and they say, we'd like to do something, but we don't know which way you're going to move, and therefore we can't invest without that greater certainty. So there is this hang up in terms of where things are, and a degree of tension around the domestic politics and domestic policy and domestic investment. And those same companies working very profitably in places around the world that have chosen to make those investments already. I believe the latest reports now that China is the largest consumer of energy uh, past us now to the extent that, of course, providing for the need of 1.3 billion people is uh, quite obviously a uh, uh, and also, I believe China is one of the leading proponents and uh, innovative uh, technologies on wind. Uh, and, and here we're still sitting, uh, fighting over each other, wanting to know if we're going to excel and, uh, uh, and do more things to enhance the technologies of wind, solar, and, uh, uh, and these other green, I guess you might call them green uh, uh, technologies. Dr. O'Neill. I would just add that um, to what Dr. Pershing said about the value of policy and um, tax certainty with respect to this. Prior to joining the administration, I was an entrepreneur and a technologist. And what you care about is building markets for the long term. We actually had all of the um, leadership in this country in solar. We've had the leadership in a number of electric technologies. And yet, we have not always given policy and tax certainty uh, as well as regulatory. And there's other countries 
countries that are bypassing us. So I think that that speaks to the issue that Under Secretary Brainerd talked about, is there is a choice that we have before us, whether to be a leader or a laggard in the um, new clean energy economy. And I think that uh, there is a huge prize out there for the ones who um, really go boldly into that future. Well, the fact that we import over $700 billion worth of oil from foreign countries should tell us uh, about the reality that we're faced with and why we have not really gotten off in, in doing what we should be doing in, in uh, developing a better sources of energy. Um, Admiral Tilly, you mentioned it. I, I'm uh, very impressed with in terms of how much the Navy has gotten into. Um, do you work with the Coast Guard also? Or this is a much smaller branch, I suppose, that it doesn't deal that much with the uh, meteorological uh, science? Y yes, sir. Actually, uh, we, we work very, very closely with the uh, Coast Guard. When we stood up our task force on climate change back in May of last year, at the very initial meeting, uh, in addition to having flag officers and senior executive service from the Navy as our ex my executive steering group, uh, we have a Coast Guard uh, senior officer and from the National Oceanographic, uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We, we realized from the very first start that we could not do this and should not do this uh, by ourselves. Uh, I have gone up to uh, Juneau, Alaska, in addition to Barrow, talked to Admiral Chris Colvin. He's the commander of the 17th Coast Guard District, which is the uh, Coast Guard District responsible for all the Arctic waters. Uh, we have a good professional as well as personal relationship uh, because we really see the challenges in the Arctic really is spanning uh, the, the lower end of, of maritime security, which is very, very appropriately a Coast Guard mission, search and rescue, uh, some of the humanitarian assistance. If, God forbid, there was a significant oil spill up in the Arctic, the Coast Guard will be very, uh, very involved. The cruise ships, which are going up there now, I mean, cruise ships go up there, and where do they go? They go to the most dangerous places, because that's what people want to see. They want to see wildlife and ice, and those are poorly charted regions. Uh, the, so the Coast Guard has tremendous challenges, and we in the Navy are looking to see how we can assist them. And between NOAA, the Coast Guard, and the Navy, we can collectively uh, show U.S. government presence in an area that is rapidly growing in what we believe is strategic importance. On a uh, comparative basis, and uh, don't get me wrong to think that I don't want a very strong defense, uh, I think we are now at about a $760 billion budget for sp expenditures of the entire military uh, 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 forces of our country for a period of one year. And I'm told, according to reports, it's almost 50% of the entire military budgets of the entire world. Half, of, almost half half of the entire world budgets on their militaries is the U.S. budget on the military. Uh, do you think perhaps uh, we could shave a little bit of some of those things that we might need uh, uh, in our military needs, Admiral? Uh, now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we ought to uh, <laughs> be passive or, you know, yeah. we, we want a strong military, but at $760 billion? Yes, I, I, think, uh, I think Secretary Gates uh, has talked uh, previously uh, about how he sees the future of the Department of De Defense's budget goes. I know he has uh, publicly stated a very strong support for the Secretary of uh, State uh, and, and their budget, uh, but I really would, would defer to the Secretary of Defense on the specifics <laughs> of the budget. But uh, I, I believe if, if the senior leadership is, is very aware of the size of the budget and and the large-scale fiscal environment, sir. 20,000 subcontractors in Iraq doing business for Uncle Sam. Unbelievable. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know I've uh, detained you long enough, and I do want to sincerely thank all of you for your, for your statements, and uh, thank you very, very much. We now have in our next panel... We have Ambassador Nancy Soderberg, and Elliot, Mr. Elliot Derringer, and Mr. Reed Hunt, and uh, Dr. Redmond Clark. Let's see if we've got the right uh, parties there.
I really want to thank all of you for your extreme patience. Uh, this is the problem with having hearings at, uh, in trying to, uh, to do this. And uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Our witnesses this afternoon is uh, our Ambassador Nancy Soderberg, who's president of the Connect US Fund for well over 20 years experience in foreign policy. Ambassador Soderberg has served in the United States Senate in the White House and in the United Nations. She has a deep understanding of policy making and negotiations at the highest level of the government and at the United Nations. She has promoted democracy and conflicts resolution worldwide to achieve international recognition for her efforts to promote peace in Northern Ireland and also advise the president on policies towards China, Japan, Russia, Angola, the Balkans, Haiti, and various conflicts in Africa. Soderberg is a distinguished visiting scholar at the University of Northern Florida in Jacksonville and president and CEO of the Soderberg Global Solutions. Uh, quite a, a, uh, a tremendous depth of uh, experience that Ambassador Soderberg uh, shares with us. She served as president of the Sister Cities Program in the city of New York, and she earned a master's degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and a bachelor's degree also from Vanderbilt University and speaks fluent French. Uh, you certainly will be welcome in Tahiti if ever there's a chance you come to Tahiti. We with us also is uh, Elliot Diringer. Mr. Diringer is the Director of International Strategies at the Pew Center on Global Climate Change. He oversees the center's analysis of the international challenges posed by the climate change and strategies for meeting them and directs the center's outreach to key governments and actors involved in international climate change negotiations. Mr. Derringer came to the Pew Center from the White House where he was Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Press Secretary in his capacity, he served as principal spokesman for President Clinton and advisor to the senior White House staff on press and communications strategy. Mr. Dirigen holds a degree in environmental studies at Harvard College and also is a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University where he studied international environmental law and policy. Mr. Reed Hunt is the CEO of the Coalition for Green Capital, a nonprofit based out of Washington, D.C as well as the principal REH advisors. He is the chairman of the International Digital e Economy Accord Project and was a member of the President Barack Obama's presidential transition team where he was the economy, economic agency review group. Mr. Reed is uh, on the board of directors of Intel Corporations, a public company. Uh, tremendous uh, uh, background here for this gentleman. He's, uh, Graduated from Yale uh, and also uh, a bachelor's degree there in magna cum laude with honors and distinction. Graduated also from Yale Law School. He's a member of the executive board of the Yale Law Journal. And uh, Dr. Redmond Clark, uh, whom I believe my colleague from Illinois had introduced earlier to welcome him as well. He, uh, Dr. Clark completed both his master's and doctoral programs in human-induced climate change and effects of climate change on natural systems. Served as the assistant professor at the college university level in providing instruction and performing research in human climate interactions. Uh, a graduate of uh, Boston University as well as Elmhurst College. I uh, hope I didn't get that, uh, I got it accurately here. Uh, and just a, a tremendous uh, variety of, uh, of experience in dealing both in the private as well as in the public sector. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation to testify before the subcommittee, and I would like to begin with uh, Ambassador Soderberg. Can you turn your mic on, please? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Fali Vega of um, an island that not only is uh, by all ex, uh, speaks French, but also has really already ex been experiencing the damaging effects of, of climate change on your, your coral reefs. 
Um, and I commend the subcommittee for recognizing the economic, human, and national security implications of climate change and for giving me the opportunity to comment on how the U.S. can make smart public investments today and combat these threats tomorrow and to continue to grow the green jobs sector. Investing in climate change in the developing world will benefit the American people and the world's most vulnerable populations. It will create jobs here at home, advance our national security, and reduce global poverty. These investments will also enhance our national security. As mentioned in the Defense Department's Quaternial Defense Review, review and in your own resolution introduced last Thursday, Climate change will contribute to food and water scarcity, will increase the spread of disease, and may spur or exacerbate mass migration. It may act as an accelerant or instability or conflict, placing a burden to respond on civilian institutions and militaries around the world. And as someone who's worked at the National Security Council, as well as at the United Nations Security Council, I strongly believe the national security co concerns of inaction on climate change are clear. In addition to the destabilizing effects of climate change in unstable countries, a reliance on fossil fuels adversely affects our foreign policy. Russia is playing hardball with its oil, our ongoing military presence in the Middle East in the, and in the, Gulf, the tragedy in the Gulf near Louisiana is linked to our dependence on petroleum. And we need American leadership to change this dangerous course. So what specifically can be done? One clear far-reaching idea is for American to invest. Um, in order to prevent the economic and security costs of the current and future climate stress, and in order to ensure that the United States act as a leader and standard bearer for the new global energy economy, we need to invest in climate mitigation and adapt solutions right now. Investments in international climate financing, however, will not occur on the scale that is necessary without the support of public institutions, both domestic and international, and that is why public financing is critical. There's a wide array of feasible, innovative public financing sources being considered at the moment, which the U.S. could and should implement. Among other benefits, these financing options help reduce the amount of money the U.S. government would need to appropriate from Congress to meet the administration's Copenhagen commitment. In a difficult fiscal environment, these are very attractive uh, solutions. I'll briefly just uh, mention five of them and then be happy to go into any details during the question. Uh, the first is to redirect fossil fuel subsidies. The Obama administration has begun taking uh, steps to phase out fossil fuel subsidies and has been a, a global leader in moving the G20 towards that same goal. It has yet to embrace the opportunities, however, to, to move these revenues into climate and energy investments for the developing world. And in light of the tragedy on the Gulf, this is on the Gulf Coast, this is a simple and politically powerful case of stop funding the problem and start investing in the solution. Uh, second is international aviation and shipping mechanisms. This proposal would raise revenue for climate financing from aviation and shipping through a variety of proposed mechanisms. And it would constitute a tiny, tiny cost compared to the overall cost of airline and shipping travel. And furthermore, the political will exists. The Waxman-Markey bill approved by the House in June of 2009 included a version of this proposal. Three is special drawing rights. Uh, these are reserve assets that are created at no cost and issued by the International Monetary Fund to member countries. Uh, philanthropist George Soros, the IMF, and a broad cross-section of the NGO communities have offered proposals for generating $100 billion worth of SDRs for capitalizing or collateralizing a green climate fund or regularly converting SDRs into hard currency for climate financing. These are an untapped resource that should be, be considered a boost, not a burden for a struggling American public. A fourth is a financial transaction tax, and this would entail a very small levy on the international financial transactions such as currency exchanges, stock trades, and bond trades, and it would take advantage of the current sediments of regulating the finance sector. Lastly is setting aside a dedicated portion of the emission allowances, and this would offer an important avenue for generating climate finances that is connected directly to the source of emissions and therefore the cost of climate changes. Uh, there's also one included in the Waxman-Markey legislation. 
In conclusion, a full range of sources of public investments are needed in order to meet and hopefully exceed U.S. commitments made at Copenhagen and bring us closer to resolving a crisis which could put the risk of lives and many Americans at risk. It's time to recognize that global warming is directly linked to our core national security interest and act accordingly. Once again, let me commend you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this issue and for the committee for taking on this important issue and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Duringer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'd like to begin by thanking you also for drawing attention to this critical issue and by voicing our full support, Mr. Chairman, for the resolution that you've introduced. I'd like to emphasize three points. We believe, first, that it is in the strong national interest of the United States to provide sustained support for climate efforts in developing countries. Second, that Congress should consider a dedicated source of funding for this support. And third, that stronger climate finance should be accompanied by stronger accountability from the major developing countries on their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Some developing countries have adequate resources to finance their own climate efforts, but most do not. You've heard already why supporting these countries is important from a national security perspective. It is also in our economic interest. Other countries, including China, are taking a lead in the global clean energy market. As the United States positions itself to compete, U.S. assistance will help foster strong, stable markets for American technology. Beyond that, sustained support for developing countries is essential if we are to achieve a meaningful global response to climate change. Strong action on a global scale requires durable agreements ensuring that all major economies are doing their fair share. Developing countries will sign on to such agreements only with reasonable assurance that the United States and other developed countries will significantly scale up their support. Stronger U.S. support is therefore essential for the global deal we need to reduce our exposure to potentially catastrophic climate, climate impacts. The Copenhagen Accord represents an important political consensus among leaders that provides a basis for negotiating a strong international framework. We believe our goal should be a binding agreement with commitments from all major economies, but we will have to get there in stages. The objective for Cancun should be to build on the Copenhagen Accord with operational decisions in key areas. On finance, three steps are needed in Cancun. The first is creation of the new multilateral climate fund envisioned in the Copenhagen Accord. We favor a fund with an independent board balanced between contributors, between contributor and recipient countries. Contributions should be based on an indicative scale of assessment establishing countries' relative shares with an aggregate funding target set through periodic pledging. Donor countries should decide for themselves how to generate their respective contributions. The second step is creation of a new finance body to advise the Conference of Parties on Finance Needs and Policy and to promote coordination among the multilateral and bilateral programs providing climate finance. The third priority in the finance area in Cancun is agreeing on ways to verify financial flows and the actions they are meant to support. Further agreement on this financial architecture must come, however, as part of a balanced package. An absolutely essential element of this package is a system to verify the mitigation actions taken by developing countries without international assistance. These unsupported actions represent a substantial majority of the efforts pledged by China and other major emerging economies. It was agreed in Copenhagen that these actions would be subject to international consultations and analysis. We need an open process that lets us see clearly whether countries are in fact doing what they've promised. Progress in the negotiations depends heavily on action here at home. We recommend three specific actions on climate finance. First, we strongly urge Congress to increase appropriations for climate assistance as proposed in the President's FY 2011 budget. These funds would help address urgent needs. They would enable the United States to provide a reasonable share of the $30 billion in fast start resources pledged by developed countries in Copenhagen. And as an important signal of Congress's intent, they would help advance U.S. negotiating objectives. 
Second, we urge Congress to consider a dedicated source of funding to maintain higher levels of support over the longer term. We believe the best source would be a set aside of emission allowances under an economy-wide cap and trade system. Others that we believe are worth exploring include revenue generated through an agreement addressing emissions from international aviation and shipping, some redirection of U.S. fossil fuel subsidies or royalties, or a levy on international emission offsets. Third, Congress should establish a standing body comprised of cabinet secretaries to coordinate U.S. climate assistance and to allocate funds across bilateral and multilateral programs with appropriate congressional oversight. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we believe sustained U.S. support for climate efforts in developing countries is a sound and prudent investment in the environmental, economic, and national security of the United States. I again thank you for your attention to these issues, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Derringer. Mr. Hunt. Thank you very much, much Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be here. Uh, the Coalition for Green Capital comprises uh, business investors, financiers, project developers, and technology companies that are involved in either the production or the consumption of clean energy. There are, in our view, uh, three fundamental inputs to global development. They need to be affordable, they need to be universal, and they need to be continuously available. And they are communications, finance, and energy. No economy in the world can develop without these three inputs. No economy uh, that has developed has been able to do so without them. Uh, we uh, urge Congress to create as a vehicle to facilitate the uh, development all around the world of clean energy, something called the Energy Independence Trust. It would be what the law recognizes as a patriotic organization. An example would be the Red Cross. There are more than 90 such examples. The Boy Scouts of America is an example. Congress from time to time has created these corporations for special purposes. They are typically charitable organizations, and so they are used to aggregate charitable contributions from all around the world. Uh, like the United States Postal Service, we would urge that Congress permit the Energy Independence Trust to borrow from the United States Treasury. It's also the case that the Energy Independence Trust, while it would not seek regular annual appropriations, could on an ad hoc basis be the subject of specifically designated appropriations. Most importantly, on an international level, this would be a vehicle to complement and supplement the uh, multilateral development banks that already exist so that we would have another institution in the landscape, but one that was not an agency or instrumentality of the United States government. The reason we're urging a new institution is because the status quo is not adequate. The global need for sustainable and affordable electricity is staggering. Roughly three billion people in the United States burn wood products in order to live day to day. About half of those people, about one and a half billion, have no access to electricity at all. The problem in the developing world is that electricity is not affordable, and that is the reason that it is not available. The problem in the developed world, in many cases, is that it doesn't contain a price for carbon. It's a very, very different problem. In Kentucky, electricity is all based on coal, or almost all based on coal, and is very, very cheap. But when we turn to the developing world, it either doesn't exist at all or the only source of it is going to be some carbon emitting and non-sustainable resource. Roughly speaking, uh, the total amount of foreign investment that occurs from one country into another on a global basis every year, even in the downturn that we're now in, is about a trillion dollars. And it's more than that when the global economy is growing faster. We need, in order to have the world wrapped in affordable and sustainable electricity, we need about 10 percent of that one trillion every year to be dedicated to clean electricity. Instead, less than 1 percent is dedicated to that purpose, and that number has fallen as the global economy uh, has dropped. So that gap between 1 percent of total FDI and 10 percent of FDI has to be met by some set of 
governmentally led actions and most importantly private sector led actions so ambassador soderberg has suggested a number of very very creative ideas for how money could be obtained i've just heard testimony that also supports this basic idea and what i'm suggesting mr chairman is a legal framework for receiving aggregating and mobilizing the kinds of capital that were that is necessary just two weeks ago, the United Nations, in a meeting hosted by the richest man in the world, Carlos Slim, in Mexico City, said that it's clear now that the private sector has to do more and that governments are unfortunately going to be constrained and are going to end up doing less to meet the funding gap. Uh, just within the same month, the 11 nations in the Pacific small island developing states said that they were worried about the bureaucratic red tape that is already ensnaring the fairly limited uh, government funds that are available as they think about their uh, threatened future. So what we're suggesting here is this new institution that can provide a new channel for low-cost, long-term financing of clean energy in the developing world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Uh, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for inviting me back again. You are showing extraordinary patience in that regard. Um, when I listen to all the comments that have been made here, a number of points that uh, I wish to make uh, have been covered, so I will uh, excerpt from uh, some of the written testimony I've supplied. Um, in, in terms of my background, uh, I, I'm different, I think, than a number of people that have testified today because I'm sort of down at the other end of the feeding chain. I'm one of the doers. Uh, we're the people that actually go out, if you will, and execute on a whole host of different policies. In that regard, our view is a little bit different, perhaps the way we look at these problems is as well. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd, I'd like to touch on the fact that there are a number of different definitions of adaptation that are being used today. Uh, mine is narrower. Uh, I'm just simply talking about the uh, measures necessary to reduce vulnerability, uh, primarily focused on natural hazards. And when I use the term mitigation, I'm not talking about cutting down on carbon emissions. I'm just simply talking about uh, responding to natural hazards. Well, climate change, if and when it happens and wherever it occurs, uh, it means that the local climate is going to change, distributions are going to change, and as a result, it changes risk that we're all exposed to. Uh, ultimately, therefore, adaptation to these new hazards or newly defined hazards is local. And the idea of adaptation or response to climate change is not a single problem. It is from a policy standpoint, from a financing standpoint, but, but from an operational standpoint, it's not one problem. It's 10,000 different problems, all culture, location, and climate specific. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, over the last 40 or 50 years, uh, which unfortunately has been the bulk of my career, we've hammered out a way to deal with environmental hazards. We study the magnitude and frequency of the risk. We quantify it. We develop options. We look at cost efficiency of those options and try to come up with a priority methodology for dealing with those hazards, and then we execute on them. We try to spend the least amount of money and get the most amount of coverage. We don't do a perfect job, and we don't come up with a way of climate proofing anything. We reduce risk. Um, if you look at the literature surrounding estimates of the cost of global adaptation, you come up with extraordinary ranges of numbers. In the past five years, I've run across studies that uh, uh, talk about a 9 to $109 billion a year cost. And uh, the, the ranges that we see here are important because of the differences that we see. Uh, each report is assuming a different discount rate to look at future damages. They range upwards from 0%, and therefore they look at, at, at problems very differently and over or understate problems as a result. Secondly, everyone's looking at a different universe of, of impacted systems uh, of cities, countries, at different stages of, uh, of preparation and evolution and dealing with different hazards. Uh, third, we don't have an inventory of problems at the project level yet. Everyone is still feeling the way forward. And finally, there is no clear climatic path ahead. Um, when we talk about the issue, and you're going to ask me a question, as you have, Mr. Chairman, in the last uh, two, uh, two sessions that I attended, you asked the same question about whether we are comfortable with climate change. And I, I held my tongue before, and now I'll say I don't know because I don't know which change we're talking about. Uh, the IPCC has said we've got a vast array of possibility out here to deal with. 
Well, when you talk about hazard quantification, identification and response, ranges aren't good. They increase risk and they increase cost. If you will, uncertainty equals height in a seawall. Uncertainty equals uh, increasing cost. And when we don't know what the future holds and we've got a design today, we build and waste extraordinary amounts of money as a result. If we look at New Orleans, they're estimating $15 billion just to bring the levees up to a Category 3 hurricane capacity. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, in the area of $100 billion to get the city in, in place ready for a Category 5 storm, and they're not talking about spending that kind of money. Uh, my point is that figuring out what we're responding to is going to be a big, big deal when we try to figure out where the money goes, and spending money on structures in addition to all the other developmental dollars that are out there is going to be a major sink for money uh, in this area. So how does that tie back to financing? Well, if we, if we look at what the private sector is doing in this area, and I am by no means uh, capable of covering every element of this, what I see is that there isn't a lot of investment happening right now for one very simple reason, risk. There's too much risk. Not only the risk that the companies have the ability to pay back any money that they would borrow from the private sector, but we don't know what we're spending the money on. And when it comes to climate response, we don't know what we're responding to, and that is probably a uh, single largest issue that we're going to have to get over sometime in the next decade. Uh, earlier this week, um, the uh, uh, Secretary General, UN Secretary General's uh, high-level advisory group on climate change financing uh, came out, and one of the members of the committee uh, uh, Koch v uh, Vesser from uh, Deutsche Bank indicated $400 billion a year is available right now from the private sector in Europe, but they can't put the money in because the risk is too high. There's no insurance. They're not prepared to put the money forward as a result. So one of the questions we may want to look forward at from a policy standpoint is what can the government do to reduce risk? And I'll just, I'm over time here, but I'll just briefly run down a list the first and foremost is we've got to improve the accuracy of our models. We've got to make them more local and not so much global in, in scale. Uh, we've got to slow our heavy lift investments. Uh, we're not in a position to invest widely in uh, large scale construction from a hazards management standpoint because we don't have the data in most of the areas that we're concerned about. And then finally, of course, we're going to prioritize our projects standardize our evaluation criteria, as I know agencies have, have, uh, have a desire to do at any rate, and finally develop some level of guarantees, which a number of the other panelists here are, I think, already talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your statements, and uh, without objection, all your statements will be made part of the record, and if there are additional uh, materials you want to add on to your statements, please uh, do so. I'll be more than happy to receive them. You've already heard some of the dialogue and expressions of opinions that were given by my colleagues uh, before they left. And uh, this is not new. We, uh, I've always had a, a healthy disagreement with my good friend from California. Uh, if in fact there is such a thing as climate change and uh, uh, is it really affecting our, uh, uh, our own national interests? Uh, I think, uh, Ambassador Soderbergh, you, with your background in dealing with the National uh, Security Council and the White House, <clears throat> this seems to be the other factor that is being said quite often now when we talk about climate change, we also talk about security issues. Is this really a true uh, uh, matter that, uh, that should be part of our, uh, not only debate, but part of our substantive uh, review of this issue of climate change. It does have serious implications about our national security, does it not? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, in, in my op opinion, and this is based on uh, decades of experience in national security issues, it is absolutely a key challenge for our, uh, our national security officials. And I was pleased to see the Pentagon officials are, in fact, a little bit ahead of the game in some cases on thinking and planning about this. Um, and I did have the opportunity to hear a little bit of the debate in the last panel, um, and I just find it perplexing that, that those would, would question, uh, first of all, the science, and secondly, the, the need to move and move quickly on this issue. We are behind the curve. 
if we failed to act, failed to come up with creative solutions, and failed to have the United States in the leadership position there, we will not meet this challenge. If we fail to do so, the, the, the facts are just simply very clear. We'll have more violence, more poverty, more um, race to the, the scarce water, which is already becoming a source of conflict in Central Asia. And I think we need to show U.S. leadership at a much stronger level than we have to date. So I, I commend your leadership on this issue and, and uh, happy to continue to make the case that we need to act and act now. What I have uh, tried to do over the months and uh, since following the uh, issue from the time of the Kyoto Protocols is that I've always felt that uh, there's no question about the understanding and the technology and all of for the developed countries. They know what's going on. But what I'm more concerned about is that if we are focusing also on the needs of some 50 least developed countries, and if they are impacted also by climate change, and I think from your, if uh, some of you were here at the time of our witnesses from the state and from defense and from the Navy and uh, from USAID, uh, this is where the focus of this subcommittee is trying to bring out. Uh, I, uh, I let uh, Congressman uh, Henry Waxman and Markey and, uh, and Senator Kerry and the others take on as a policy that is being developed in our country. Uh, my concern is that should we also focus on the situation dealing with the least developed countries, but it's because it seems that they are the ones crying for help. Uh, I'm sure that we, for the developed countries, we have the resources, supposedly. But what do we do with those who are, are, are not at the same level of development, technologically, economically, socially, and all of that? Uh, where does it leave us? Uh, and this is where we're trying to keep plugging along and trying to see this $30 billion that seems to be a commitment among the Copenhagen uh, uh, member countries of the, of the accord. Uh, any comments on the, on the this amount that has been deliberated or taken to say, hey, thirty billion dollars is a good amount to consider, or should it be more? I obviously it should be more, but what can we do? I'll just comment briefly. Given the then. yeah, given the economic straits that we're under right now in our own country, I, b I believe it's actually a hundred billion. Um, and estimates are the the commitment to Copenhagen was to come up with a hundred billion dollars to help address the cost of climate change. By 2020, I believe, was the... Uh, Correct. And a lot of estimates believe the actual figure will be much higher than that. Uh, initially, advocacy groups were calling for $150 billion, came up with 100, and other estimates say it's it'll be five times that. But we cannot expect others to, to pay for this and, and shoulder the burden on their own. We simply have to do it, or they will not be able to do it. I've laid out some... Um, Financing, we need both a public and a private commitment to that. I'm concerned that the administration, while strongly committed to it, has not figured out the financing of it. Is, I think, relying very heavily on the public, pri the private sector to come up with the hundred billion, which is highly unlikely. And I was encouraged to hear the comments of of my colleagues at the table for some additional uh, ideas. But we, unless we come up with creative solutions to come up with that, and probably more, uh, we will be failing in that challenge. Well, I think Mr. Derringer made some recommendations that Congress needs to increase the funding. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, the, the 30 billion, the goal of 30 billion you reference is with respect to the fast track funding uh, from now through 2012. Um, I, I think that's a, an achievable goal. Um, should it be more, perhaps, but it re reflects a significant political consensus, and I think the objective at the moment should be to ensure that we deliver on that promise. Um, if one looks at the pledges on the table from the developed countries, I think we are approaching $30 billion, but I'll emphasize uh, the word pledges. Uh, d delivery over the next couple of years will be vitally important. Um, the European Union has pledged on the order of $9 billion, Japan on the order of $14 billion. Uh, with the increase of the appropriations approved by Congress for FY10 and with the, uh, the proposed increase for FY11 that the President has proposed, uh, the U.S. contribution would be on the order of $3 billion. Uh, so together with uh, some others as well, that's, that's beginning to approach $30 billion. 
Um, we, we've talked a lot about uh, why this type of funding is in the U.S. interest from an economic perspective, security perspective, diplomatic perspective. I, I just think it's worth noting that it is also quite consistent with some of our cherished American values, and here I would emphasize um, our humanitarian values. Uh, time and again, we've seen the generosity of the American people uh, when others around the world are in need, most recently uh, the earthquake in Haiti, for instance. Uh, increasingly, I think the U.S. humanitarian record uh, will be seen against the backdrop of increased climate impacts. Um, so I think it is not only in our interest, but very consistent with our values to step up and to provide the increased support that's needed. Mr. Hunt? I think that, I think that it's uh, going to be necessary to supplement these government commitments by something like the Energy Independence Trust that would aggregate charitable uh, contributions from many, many sources the exact same way that the Red Cross uh, currently operates and uh, does so in an international concert of similar institutions created in, in other countries. And the reason is that our, the essential problem here is that a great deal more has to be invested in alternative energy production and consumption everywhere in the world. Uh, in addition to the fact that this is consistent with American values, as Mr. Derringer has correctly said, it's also the case that when we mobilize resources to create alternative energy markets in the developing world, we are creating markets for the export of some of our highest value uh, goods and services. We are right now a significant exporter to China of solar technologies. We are a significant exporter, we are a significant investor in R&D in alternative energy. In fact, we probably are leading the world right now in the wake of the Stimulus Act in investment in research and development in alternative energy. So if we create in new developing economies growth markets for alternative energy, we're not only doing the right thing for the world and the right thing for the client, we're also doing the right thing for American businesses and American workers. Everywhere in the world, the imperative is to have scale, massive investment and massive deployment in wind and sun and all other alternative energies. And so if we have that scale built in part of the developing world, It'll lower the overall cost and make it easier for us to deploy those exact same products and technologies here in the United States. Dr. Clark? Uh, I have to agree with the comment Mr. Deringer made about, uh, uh, about American values. And uh, uh, Ranking Member Manzullo uh, brought up the, the counterpoint, you know, w which is an extraordinary challenge for us right now, which is we have people here that are also in need and uh, people that are today feeling a great deal of pressure. Uh, I don't envy your position. I, I know that, that simple spending, uh, simple additional spending uh, without a larger plan, without a larger context, I think is, uh, you know, from a taxpayer's perspective, going to be very, very difficult to push in this country. Uh, it's worth the effort. Uh, I mean, I certainly agree with that. It's, it is worth the effort. I don't see the immediate solution. But uh, uh, the, the one uh, item of hope, I guess, that I would bring in the, in the comments that I made was that uh, these changes that we're looking at are the changes now, not, not preventative action, but the changes that we're looking at right now are gradual. They are not, they're not going to be upon us in a matter of three, four, five years. Uh, there are other, a number of other significant economic forces that are at work right now that may very well come in and significantly for our plans. I've, I've spoken to this committee before about some of the issues about energy supply and the importance of alternatives within that context. So we face a significantly un uncertain future. I don't see a clear path through, but uh, I, I understand the effort that you are, at least in concept, committing to, and I certainly support it. Do you agree with the administration's uh, initiative uh, in really making more investments uh, into the alternative uh, energy sources other than just our dependence on fossil fuel as we have been for all these years. And uh, I guess you talk about uh, green, green energy seems to be the spoken word and that uh, we're doing this. Uh, it seems that we're not moving fast enough, or am I correct, am I wrong on this? Any comments on this? I'll say one thing if I might. Uh, 
the Department of Energy is uh, making the single largest focused uh, commitment of funds and brain power to alternative energy that any government in the world has ever done. And I'm talking about over the last two years and on into the, into the next year. The central problem is that we actually don't have a large market for alternative energy here in the United States. The reason we don't is that because of the economic slump, the overall demand for electricity in the United States dropped in 2009 and will be down in 2009 and 2010, the only two years since World War II that demand for electricity in the United States is down. And because we haven't taken the measures that uh, encourage people to phase out their existing uh, generation sources based uh, principally in coal, since we haven't taken those measures, people are not phasing out and moving to alternative and they're not uh, uh, turning to their customers and saying, I guess I need to get new electricity for you. The last couple of weeks in Washington have been an exception in the local area, but in general, this is the big truth. Where is demand? It is in China and it is in the developing world. And we need to recognize that the Chinese government is awake and alert and is meeting that demand and they are bringing low cost financing tools to the whole rest of the world with this one little proviso. You have to buy the Chinese products in order to have the financing. So as a matter of geopolitical strategy, as a matter of opening export markets and as a matter of having markets to sell our wonderful taxpayer paid research into, we have to have a plan to create alternative energy markets all around the world. It might also be interesting to note that as of March 2010, China has a foreign exchange reserve of almost $2.5 trillion. I don't know how this compares to us at this point. I'd like to uh, turn the time over to my good friend, my colleague, uh, Congressman Inglis, for his set of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, I was just interested in that last exchange and wondering whether uh, you all might want to comment on this. The, it seems to me that, um, broadly speaking, there are two, three, three approaches we could take. One is to subsidize um, uh, various technologies by having the government basically pick winners or losers. Uh, the second is to, um, is to mandate certain technologies, which is sort of like the first, except it's a more direct mandate. Um, and then the third is just to set an elegant price on carbon and watch the free enterprise system in all of its creativity solve the problem. Um, the third, obviously, the way I'm describing it is what I prefer, um, which uh, I wonder whether you might want to comment on this. You know, the, my, my sense is that cap and trade is soon going to have a death certificate uh, when that death certificate is issued, um, and it seems to be in the process of being issued now, um, we have an alternative. Um, and the alternative is a revenue neutral tax swap. Where basically what you do is you reduce payroll taxes or marginal rates or corporate taxes. Or pick one, but the one that I picked in a bill was uh, FICA taxes, reduce FICA taxes and then in equal amount shift the tax to emissions so that it's revenue neutral, the government is not taking any additional money out of the economy. Um, and then um, you apply that mixture to imported goods as well as uh, domestically produced. Um, and it's a border adjustable tax, it's removed on export and imposed on import. Um, we think in a WTO compliant way. Um, the exciting thing about that is um, I think that when, what, what would happen is the free enterprise system would figure out all kinds of ways to fix this problem. But the, the challenge is you can't get there from here because the incumbent fuels, being petroleum and coal that we're mostly concerned about, natural gas to some extent, um, when it comes to climate change, we're concerned about those. When it comes to petroleum, we're concerned about it for national security reasons. Um, when it comes to health, indicators we're concerned about coal, very much concerned about coal. Um, but the negative externalities aren't recognized and therefore the, there's a market distortion and fixing that market distortion is what we should be about. Seems to me that's a key role of government. Um, anybody want to comment on that about whether that this is, uh, that the pricing of carbon is really the thing that would cause a free enterprise system to deliver a solution? 
Mr. Green. Or, um, I, I appeared before the, uh, the committee about a year ago and then a year before that, and in the course of those discussions, uh, especially in the Q&A afterwards, one of the uh, one of the comments that I made, which is in line with the uh, um, uh, with uh, Congressman Manzullo's comments earlier today, was that that uh, there, there's a presupposition here when we talk about policy that the price of carbon is going to remain relatively stable. And and in the past uh, roughly 12, 14 months, uh, data that's been coming out of the IEA and other agencies like that indicates that uh, that oil may very well be the first of the of the global fuels uh, that may in fact uh, experience some form of supply related upset. Uh, their suggestion was that uh, as early as 2016 uh, we could in theory have some supply side problems where uh, uh, supply can't meet demand in which case we would have an insertion of an elegant, I believe you called it an elegant price for carbon. It would be something more than elegant, I suspect. Uh, and, and the thing that we would want to avoid would be the, the speed of onset. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, what you're talking about, which is not fundamentally different than other approaches that look at ways of, of, of putting a price on carbon, uh, that buys us time to begin to adjust away from that. Uh, my second comment would be this, that in 1980, uh, US EPA designated a category of waste is hazardous waste, and the market that evolved from that drove the, the cost of treatment and disposal somewhere in the $400 to uh, $1,200 a ton range. Uh, at that time, the uh, U.S. was generating 300 million tons of hazardous waste a year. Today, the U.S. generates 4 million tons of hazardous waste, and the disposal price for most of it is now under $50 a, a ton. <coughs> it's precisely the, uh, you know, the kind of model that you're talking about. And the question is, how do we do it in a way that it's going to be economy neutral? And the one other point I would make is that today, the greatest negotiating lever that the U.S. has is access to its market. We are a necessary part of, for example, China's economic renaissance. We are a necessary part of the European Union's economic activities. So as long as we have access to our market and as long as China doesn't fully swing over to more of an internalized uh, uh, demand and supply system, we have an opportunity to use that leverage in a manner that you're describing. Uh, if we don't take that step, probably within the next 10 years or so, within the next decade, I expect that China will simply be immune to that. And since China is now the leading uh, energy consumer and expects to continue to grow through 2030 in terms of energy demand, if we're going to deal with the problem, we've got to start there. Go ahead, Mr. Dirger. Uh, Mr. Inglis, we would uh, wholeheartedly endorse your preference for choice number three, uh, the use of market-based market mechanisms to price carbon uh, for a wide range of reasons. Uh, first, because uh, we believe that they would provide for the most cost-effective means of reducing our emissions, but also uh, because a pricing mechanism provides an ongoing incentive uh, to companies to innovate. Uh, and to develop the technologies that would be needed to cost-effectively reduce emissions and uh, thereby allow the market to pick the winners, as you say. Um, I'm not sure that we are quite prepared just yet to join in signing the death certificate on cap and trade, mm -hmm. um, uh, but we would certainly be happy to explore with you uh, any alternative market-based mechanisms that you think might, uh, might find some favor uh, in the near future in the Congress. Uh, beyond uh, pricing mechanisms, though, we believe there are probably some other pro uh, targeted policies that we would need to ensure that certain types of technologies that might not uh, get the necessary incentive through a pricing mechanism are developed and demonstrated and deployed, uh, in particular, uh, carbon capture and storage. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. And I, I just might point out, the cap and trade is 1,200 pages, I believe it is. The bill that I just described is 15 pages, 15 pages. So uh, it, it can be done much more elegantly than 15 or 1,200 pages. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, this gentleman, the, the, my good friend, the gentleman from Illinois for his questions. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. I, um, I guess I'm bothered by statements I don't want to use the word bothered. Um, concerned. I, I'm concerned, thank you, Chairman, uh, by statements uh, such as that by Ambassador Soderberg 
uh, quoting the World Wildlife Fund that 850,000 new permanent jobs will be created if U.S. businesses capture 14 percent of the export market in just four clean energy technologies. Uh, and then, then they're laid out there. Government doesn't create jobs. Uh, the cap and trade, even the threat of it, uh, cost a billion dollar investment in Rentec uh, over on the Mississippi River in East Dubuque, Illinois, in my district. They were going to have the first uh, Fisher Tropes conversion in the United States using coal coming up the Mississippi River uh, as a feedstock for anhydrous ammonia, urea, and other uh, agricultural application products. When uh, then candidate Obama in June of um, 2008 uh, made the statement about uh, taxing carbon emissions. Uh, the banks pulled the plug on that. And um, you would have had uh, diesel fuel, uh, airplane fuel would have been a byproduct of that. It would have triggered a green technology revolution across uh, the top part of, of, of the state of Illinois. There wasn't a time when 535 members of Congress woke up at 6 o'clock on a Tuesday morning and decided that Congress knows how to invent green technology. Green technology is nothing more than, called, than what's called productivity. And given to its own devices, the private sector can well take care of that. Let me just give you an example of that. Uh, Ibsen is a, a German equity-owned company in the congressional district that I represent. They make the world's only vacuum um, a hardening machine. It sells for less than $200,000. It's very efficient, it's portable, it's programmed in different languages. Their issue is, is, is not getting Congress involved in more um, tax breaks because it's a very efficient machine, but a free trade agreement with Brazil. Uh, Dan Foss is a Danish firm that has about 400 jobs in the congressional district I represent. Uh, they make a machine that hooks onto other machines that modulates the exact amount of electricity that goes in to run a power system. Uh, all world manufacturing uh, in Harvard, Illinois, uh, makes a machine uh, that re replaces a, a tank into which you pump air to run a hydraulic pump, whereby uh, the amount of electricity is reduced by 80 percent. This goes on all the time in manufacturing. And manufacturers are really upset, very upset, when Congress says it can create jobs. Congress is destroying jobs in manufacturing. This cap and trade uh, and the health care bill that we passed has made the have made the manufacturers so jittery about business expansion that jobs are going to China. I mean, if you really want to help out manufacturing, to make us in a better position, then we need to back off things such as cap and trade and get back with uh, more expensing and um, um, more bonus depreciation in, in, in items like that. But I just, if anybody wants to comment it, that's fine. I, I picked on you, Ambassador, so I guess you would have the first response on that. And I did withdraw the word bothered and say I'm concerned, and the record will note that, and thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, well, thank you very much, and I appreciate both being bothered and concerned, um, <laughs> particularly when you represent a, a district that gets so directly impacted by many of the decisions um, in this issue. And I think any uh, any government approach for trying to change the the mix that uh, is used to address the problem of climate change has to take into effect the impact on s the real people whenever you change. Uh, industry approaches and that that's real those stories are real those people are real and that I think is is an impact um, that has to be taken into account in any public public decision so I, I understand your concerns about the impact of some of these decisions on your constituencies um, I look at it as um, a, a national security expert and as a national security expert I don't have to represent people in your home district or any home district, but I look at the U.S. national interest as a country at, at, in the 20th century. Well, my century. district isn't much different than the other congressional districts with regard to needs for national security ambassador. 
Uh, that is true, and I would argue that um, for, and the national security of this country has to take a hard look at our dependence on fossil fuel in terms of the national security, both on the countries on whom we rely for those fossil fuel imports, which will not change even if we increase our domestic energy sourcing exponentially in any uh, significant way in the next decade or several decades, uh, probably a generation. Um, and the climate change impact for our reliance on fossil fuel from a national security perspective is something that we need to address. Um, the but the coal, issue comes up, is the coal comes up the Mississippi River from central Illinois. That's not being imported. No, but I, what we're talking about here is how to address the issue of our reliance on, uh, on fossil fuel uh, for our main sourcing of energy and how can we expand that so we're not as reliant on the, the most polluting sources of energy. And that's what all of us are, are trying to address. And to, to do that, um, we are going to have to have a shift away from the fossil fuel uh, reliance on our industry. And the way we can do that, is there's elegant ways of the, the pricing of the carbon tax you can do it, I would argue. And yeah, but that, that destroys jobs. Is, you go out there and you, and you tax people for using carbon-based energy, I mean, solar and, 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 and wind power make up about 1% of our energy today in the United States. And if they were to make it's, up 4%, it's, it's 1%. They, but the challenge is if you can invest more in some of these alternative energies, people in your district may have alternative options of job creating sources. Yeah, but and that's the government. The that's, government that's, that's the government cannot create jobs. That's theory. I'm not saying the government should create these jobs, but the government can, for instance, stop supporting fossil fuels with subsidies, which it's already very much involved in supporting that industry. In so that would do away with ethanol. Billions. Excuse me? That do away with ethanol. Well, uh, the point is that the government's already very involved in some of these issues. And the question is, can you come up with a mix that is both promoting less reliance on fossil fuel industries and creating jobs in other areas, and I'm convinced there is a mix there. And at the and same time, the government, to use that term, is in the process of shutting down offshore drilling, where we get the source of 30 percent of our oil, uh, is in the pro that will not allow drilling to take place in the Anwar, will not allow the pipe, the new pipe to come through Canada to the United States, and has a moratorium on offshore drilling in a good part of Alaska. So where's the energy supposed to come from? Well, that's our point, is we're supposed to try and um, invest, as we've heard today, in ways of getting past, and you can look at what's happening in the Gulf, and there are lots of problems with offshore drilling, and this is not a hearing about offshore drilling, nor am I an expert on that, but I do believe that we need to look at a creative mix but it, it, of it how won't, do you get past It won't that work. That if you take all the windmills that are going to go on Cape Cod, okay, they all put out as much energy as an oil, an oil well uh, that's pumping about uh, 10 barrels a day. I mean, it's, it's not very much. It's, it, it's, it's, I mean, wind power is, is fine, but there's never going to be enough wind power and never enough solar power unless it's, you know, it could be 100 years down the line to, uh, to be able to compensate for um, arbitrarily, in my opinion, shutting down uh, the offshore drilling. Let me just close and give my colleagues a chance to, on your, on your original point on investment, I think it's important to just come back to you on the 14% uh, the, the of the export market. The, the, the fact is that if we can invest in smart grid equipment, mass transit, wind turbines, solar, investing in the technology thing, we will. But the technologies are there. Why is the government jobs? investing in technologies that the private sector has already developed? I mean, Nissan has the LEAF. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and GMC has the vote, and now the president was in, in Holland, Michigan, opening up a factory uh, to invest in, in, uh, in developing an automobile battery. I mean, what these manufacturers want is just to be left alone. They don't want the help of Washington. I've, I've got to go 
vote in banking in about three minutes, but I can't well, go with the union opportunity. Before you go, Mr. Manzullo, I, I would agree completely with you that it's the, the private sector we have to look to to deliver, whether it's jobs or technology. Uh, but when we have important social priorities, I think that uh, the market may need some regulatory incentives and some regulatory certainty. Um, you, you cited the example of a Danish firm. I'm not uh, familiar with the particular example, um, but I do know when we look globally at the countries that have established themselves as leaders in the clean energy marketplace, um, each of them has accomplished that by uh, adopting policies at home to create incentives for those technologies. They've, they've provided uh, their, uh, their private enterprises with the incentive to develop those technologies, to market those technologies, and now they have surpassed the United States uh, in that marketplace, uh, whether we're talking about Denmark or Germany or China. Uh, each of them has quite strategically uh, made use of public policy uh, to advance those technologies and to advance their economic positioning globally. So I, I think it's important for us to, to look at the policy choices. Um, our preference uh, among instruments would again be a market-based approach that in fact harnesses market forces uh, to achieve our objectives as cost-effectively as possible. Uh, Congressman Manzullo, as you know, I'm, uh, among other things, I have manufacturing operations inside your district. Um, and and I, it's very easy to operate at a policy level and lose sight of the fact that, that there, is a, there is trench warfare going on right now with our manufacturers. And, and what, what we're all struggling with, and, and I heard some very impressive things said uh, about an hour or so ago when people were talking about getting beyond the gridlock. The problem, the transition that we're talking about is today, if, if a laborer in China is put into the appropriate factory resources and is satisfied living at $5 a day in, in salary, compared to a laborer here in the U.S. that is barely getting by with 30 or $40 a, uh, an hour in total costs, it is extraordinarily difficult for a company to compete. We are at that point in many of our manufacturing industries, and we cannot look at the U.S. economy as a functioning entity absent manufacturing. And that, that, that's a simple truth. There is no easy way through this transition. I truly believe that we are looking 60, 70 years down the road, we are going to be looking at a fundamental energy transformation globally. It has to happen just because of the way supply and demand is working right now. It's coming whether we deal with, with climate change or not. It's coming. And so the question is how effectively can we maneuver our way through this? I don't have a lot of answers, but I can tell you this, that, that China is, is, is dominating in solar cell production because they are well on their way to turning it into something that is no more different than, than making hamburgers. And they're talking about making incredibly low-cost cells in order to justify the technology and make it work, okay? Their operating plan is no different than any other manufacturer. Find a way to make it as incredibly cheap as possible. Utilize your resources domestically as much as you can, and the chances are that you're going to win. That's exactly what they're doing. So we're fighting them uh, directly and indirectly in a number of different industries. They're all playing the same games right now. They have fewer regulations. They have lower labor costs. Uh, they have fewer taxes from their government, and it gives them a competitive advantage that is greater than the freight cost to ship their goods into the United States. If we're going to legislate, if the legislature is going to get involved and do anything at all, they had better take real care and, and pay real attention to the impact on a major portion of the U.S. economy. And, and part of what we're talking about, uh, Congressman Inglis, you were referring to uh, an idea where there would be effectively a carbon tax that would e equalize it. Well, that doesn't cut both ways because the carbon tax equalizes imported products and it doesn't equalize exported products. And what we have to do is that we have to get to a uniform price for, for global carbon. We're not there yet. Okay, we want the price to be very high because of the uh, environmental ramifications. The rest of the globe, Europe aside, uh, generally does not want that to occur. China is engaging in neo-colonial activities right now by going out and buying up as uh, vast amounts of energy, carbon energy resources, because they fully intend to use those to fund the expansion of their economy. 
I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a, a, a trade war, if you will, that is evolving. And our challenge isn't just to find a way to make technology operate so that it can generate energy. Our challenge is to find a way to deal with the international trade uh, implications of, of a transfer away from carbon fuels in a way that doesn't destroy our economy. Mr. Chairman, I follow up on that. It's just to follow up on that briefly. Actually, my idea is it's a, it's a border adjustable tax, so it's removed on export, imposed on import. So it's like the VAT in Europe. European VAT is removed on export, imposed on import. So your goods would actually leave here without the revenue neutral carbon tax attached to them. Great. That's a great step in the right direction then. Because then you, you don't decimate American manufacturing. That's the problem with cap and trade, seems to me, is it decimates American manufacturing. And that way I would agree with Mr. Manzullo. Where I disagree with Mr. Manzullo is that um, he's uh, overlooking the fact that in South Carolina we'd love to have more nuclear power plants. But the Public Service Commission probably wouldn't approve a public, probably wouldn't approve a private uh, investor owned utility constructing a nuclear power plant because it's just more expensive. Um, it's more expensive power. It's a great source of power, in my view. It's very clean. But that's because coal doesn't have to be accountable for all of its emissions. If you force that recognition, you force the accountability, coal is nowhere near as cheap as it looks. Talk to the pulmonologist about that, the small particulates involved in coal, even if you think climate change is hooey. The small particulates associated with hospital admissions that the pulmonologists would tell you about, it's a real and quantifiable cost. So force that recognition and say to coal, be accountable. Then all kinds of other technologies start taking play, uh, become possible. Uh, nuclear becomes possible. Right now it's not possible. And uh, same with uh, petroleum. If you did just a little bit of cost accounting and said, listen, all the, some of the costs that we're spending right now in the Straits of Hormuz to keep that supply line open for that product that we got to have, that we are absolutely addicted to, just attribute some of it to gasoline. Gasoline is not 250 a gallon. It's way higher than that. It's just it's hidden from the consumer. And so the consumer can't make a choice. It makes a logical choice because it's a subsidized price. It's hidden. But if you force that recognition, wow, all kinds of things would start happening. Um, and we'd be, we'd be doing what Israel's doing maybe, which is trading out batteries in cars, right? The reason we don't do the batteries that Mr. Manzullo mentioned is that um, it, it's expensive and cumbersome. But if you're in need, like Israel is, then you figure out a way to swap out battery packs and it becomes cost effective in a, situ a situation where you force a recognition of all these negative externalities, right? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going on and on preaching about my bill. It's a, I hope you'll take a look at it. 15 pages. It's a quick read. I uh, thank my colleague and friend for his uh, line of questions. I uh, just wanted to comment uh, to uh, Dr. Red uh, Clark's earlier statement about China's development. I think. It's not so much out of greed, but out of necessity uh, that I think we find that China has no choice uh, to provide for the needs of some $1.3 billion. We have to give those people some sense of credit. How, how is it possible that they have to feed some 1.3 billion people? We can't even feed our own 300 million that we have here in our own country, it seems like. But uh, I do want to thank all of you for your participation. I don't know if we really, we kind of nibble really at the, the whole idea of, of uh, how we can come up with better ideas and financing uh, the needs of our least developed countries in, uh, when we talk about the issue of climate change. Uh, but I think we uh, were able to discuss quite well uh, related issues that it is tied to climate change. I think it was very productive. So with that, I, I do sincerely want to thank you for your patience and for your being here to testify before this subcommittee. So with that, the subcommittee will be adjourned.